Okay, I'm gonna call the meeting to order then at 631. Um, additions to the agenda on the select board memo, we have none. Does anybody else have additions? I warn you, we have a very long agenda tonight. So if you want to put an addition on, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> um, review of minutes, December 5th, 2022. I have a few comments, excellent as usual, and a few details. On um, page two, the Wrightsville Beach item, second line, if approved, please add Mr. O'Neill said, comma. So it's clear that it's a representation from him. And just a grammatical nitpick in the next paragraph. First sentence, please take out the comma after 2023. And then- uh, is, that our for is that our form? <laughs> Not to put commas after numbers? Uh, no, our form is uh, not to put commas in between clauses that are not complete clauses. This is not a case of a run on sentence. So you're saying no comma after 2023? That's correct. I don't have any commas for mine, but where, which line are you on? I'm on? The third line I have on that paragraph. The second paragraph, the first line. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I have too. You have a comma? Right here. No, the, the second paragraph. Oh, down here. Oh, second paragraph of that. You can't get rid of the comma. I, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just agree with the drafter of the minutes. I don't. I'm not going to die on that sword, though. So. No, I mean grammatically, you would need a comma if it said 2023, but he questioned the necessity. But it's the same subject in the final clause as it is in the first clause, so there's no comma. And then, you know, I'm wondering. Deidre, if you've been with us when we've had dissent in our vote, uh, but uh, uh, our our past practice has been to note uh, the people who voted against something when we do have non-unanimous. Sure. So if you oh, because like, you want your name in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want my name in there more often. Yeah. <laughs> right, I can see that. <laughs> Even if it's on that. <laughs> so if you wow. put in Mr. Etnayer or Etnayer in parentheses, that, that's how we've done it. Just, uh, just after the number or? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Before the period. And just after the one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And oh, very good. Then on the next page, um, the first paragraph under the discussion on 2023 town meeting, um, in the fourth line, after you've introduced town clerk LaCare, um, after town clerk, if you could just put parenthesis, capital T, capital C, close parenthesis, since you use the abbreviation early later on, it's easier for the reader to go back and figure out where that came from. So she's parentheses, quote, TC, quote, parentheses? No quotes, just parentheses. I would suggest Brown, quotes, yeah. TC, quote. I've, I've never seen that. In all my but we do it all the time. So where do you want to put the uh, town clerk the care? Can you town, want to put... town clerk parenthesis um, TC close parenthesis. Oh, oh. And I'm yeah. suggesting it's quote TC quote. Yeah, that's that's legal documents. Isn't this a legal document? <laughs> this is illegal. Really... The way you of guys it probably is legal. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm using the quotes or not? I don't care. Oh, I, I care. do. Let's use yeah. the quotes. I'll put them in. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. So it's paren quote TC quote paren. Okay, on page four. Oh, page four, yeah. And this is not a suggestion for a change because this is accurate how it is, and it's my motion. But reading through this, I, I wish that I had phrased the motion differently, and I just want to bring that up for discussion. Um, the problem okay. is that we have a motion that refers in two different ways to the same thing. I'm sorry, Carl. Where are you? Where are you? I'm sorry. On the minutes, I'm. I, I'm I missed... in page four under the East Montpelier Fire Department fund balance item. Okay, thank you. To, yep. to motion to approve transferring the remainder. Yeah, yeah. So we're calling. We're referring to the remainder of the balance mm -hmm. and the total of six thousand seven hundred fifty-four yeah. dollars. And that is. Um, I mean, that's according to the information that we were given, and I trust that it's correct. But. Yeah. <laughs> so interestingly enough, there was interest that came in that was not reflected in that number. There is a there is a note on the TA 
to let you know that there was an additional, I think it's $13 okay. um, note for this meeting, that okay. there's an additional $13 of interest. Okay. Earned. Interesting. So um, the amount did change. So yeah. yes. So, so had it just said remaining balance, we would be covered. So I'm asking you tonight to okay. tweak that to cover that we have an additional $13,000 included in that warrant. So okay. That so you're, you're saying leave out the amount? I'm thinking the amount is important to have in the minutes, but that should be up not in the motion itself. So in the body of the minutes, we discussed that there's a total of $6,754 in that fund. And then the motion would read, to, to transfer the yeah. remainder of the balance in the, the fund to the East Montpelier Fire Department. So that's how I would like to do it next time. Yeah, I'm glad you learned something out of that. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, yeah. We'll be tweaking that a little tonight. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. we're going to correct it. Yeah. 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 And then finally on page five, uh, for the meeting schedule, you've got the correct dates for January, but they are not the regular meeting dates. Each oh. one of them is a Special meeting date because of the January 2nd holiday. Yeah. And a special meeting date because of the January 16th holiday. Okay. And that's it. Thanks to the edit. Anybody else? That's enough, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want Carl to hog it. <laughs> Why? He really does. See, who controls the computer that can make that sign go away in the middle? Oh. Oops. <laughs> Oops, that one there. I can get it. See if you can get around all that equipment. There we go. Yeah. Now so, we can see a blank screen that says Amy was. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anybody have any further comments on the minutes? I must make a motion that we approve the minutes um, uh, from December 5th, 2022, and uh, with the uh, discussed change. Second. second. Good, got the second. We'll say. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes appear to have it, they do have it. Minutes are done. Um, okay. Public comment. Out of public comment. I don't see anybody raising their hands. No, wait. What's that? Is there? Scott's connecting to audio. Scott's connecting to audio. You're on mute, Scott. <laughs> Scott, are you public commenting on anything? Or are you just if, if you're in the same room as Amy, one of you is gonna have to turn off your audio while you talk, Scott, your speakers. Scott had no legit public comment. He accidentally <laughs> hit the button. <laughs> okay. Good enough. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Right on time here. 640 budget discussion. Kellogg, Hubbard, and Library. That's me. Okay. Right. Take the floor. Do you want to sit up here? Well, do I, do I have to? You don't have to, but if you'd like to, it would be good. Um, it would be good. <laughs> Well, I just think that you feel more part of the discussion. Yeah, you won't be on camera at all. If the goal is for everyone to see her, um, you can see my back. Yeah, we see your back really well. Sitting next to John would allow people to see your face, but we can see you from a distance in the um, a different uh -oh. view. Can I, can I say music? I will not say here. Yeah, I can move over. <laughs> well, because I've gotten a lot of people complain because the board's broken. I need to take another So do I, but they say, I say I like it. And they say, well, because you're sitting at the head and you don't have to crook at your back. So I'm just pushing back against that. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay. All right. You ready to rock and roll? I think so. Okay. I mean, you know, to the extent. Are you ever. feeling um, good about being on camera? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I am Carolyn Brennan. I'm one of two co-directors at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. I have with me tonight Sarah Sarah Swift over here. Hi, Sarah. Uh, Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah is our new uh, East Montpelier representative to our board of trustees. Uh, Jennifer Micah 
uh, is um, finishing up her term at the library, has now finished up her term at the library uh, and is leaving us and Sarah is taking over. Looking forward to having her officially confirmed in January. Um, but, so anyway, so she's here mostly to, to listen to me at this point for which I apologize, you know, deeply to all of you. <laughs> um, so we have had a wonderful year at the library this year. Uh, we did a couple of we, uh, very important things. We updated our mission statement and we have now an approved strategic plan uh, for 2023 to 2025. I brought copies of the strategic plan in case anybody, I brought copies of the shorter version of the strategic plan, the one page version, uh, in case anybody would like a copy of that, I'm happy, I'll just leave them here. Um, you can recycle any that they have the long version. Don't want. Yeah, packets. and you have the long version in your packets that has all of our mm -hmm. action steps and benchmarks. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also brought copies of our annual report. Did I send that to you as well? Yes. Conclusion. Okay. Yeah, they all right. Yep. Well. Okay, cool. well, I won't leave you print versions then, unless somebody <laughs> wants. <them. laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so we had a wonderful. We're back to pre-pandemic conditions in the library. We're seeing uh, tons of daily foot traffic. We're uh, back now to our full complement of programming. Although when I uh, compiled our statistics and the report that's going to go in your town report, uh, it would, that's still showing our numbers being low for programming. It was still a, a holdout and an effect from, from the pandemic. But now we're starting to, to really, again, see that return there also. Uh, lending, yeah, lending is incredibly strong. We had over 350,000 print circulations, another 35,000 electronic circulations for digital resources. We're still, it's still a little bit of a, of a dance around digital, um, digital material for the library because I'm always conscious of the fact that once you get out of the city of Montpelier, your, the likelihood that you have broadband access diminishes significantly. And so I don't want to push too hard to switch our, to, and we'll never really switch our print collection over, but I don't want to push too hard to uh, spend money on digital collections and increase the digital collections until I'm sure that people can actually access them pretty reliably. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason that that number is not higher uh, is because I have not pushed to expand that collection as quickly as I might. Do you have a sense of whether it's lack of broadband or just lack of familiarity with the format that has kept digital numbers down besides you not pushing? Of course, I think it's a little bit of both, honestly. Mm -hmm. And there has been some, uh, some fairly recent, it, it always takes people a while to get uh, comfortable and familiar with using an, an app. And there are people like me that don't necessarily want to engage with yet another app for something. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that it's probably a combination of factors. Mm -hmm. And I do think that we'll see it increase uh, as, we, as we move forward. And that is something where I'll have to invest in our collection. I'll have to invest in our digital collection at some point. Right, right. Because when it comes to books and magazines, I mean, the bandwidth for those is almost Minimal. nothing. It's almost yeah. nothing, exactly, yeah. And, um, but unfortunately the cost for uh, books, not quite so much, but for magazines, a uh, digital magazine costs about 10 times what its analog, for what its print counterpart costs wow. Wow. in some cases. It varies quite a bit, um, but like our, we have a subscription to consumer reports in yeah. digital format and you can see back issues and everybody can connect to it simultaneously. It's an awesome resource. Uh, but it costs where a, a consumer report subscription costs us maybe forty dollars. It costs like a thousand dollars. Wow! It's a it's a significant. That's it's crazy. A, it's a chunk of change. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, yeah. So, so you know, like I was saying, we're getting back to our new normal. Um, we are. Uh, what else did I want to say? We're seeing a lot more. Um, gap filling and at other other meetings i explained that like uh, we have people that we already see people who are experiencing homelessness or other forms of insecurity or benefits insecurity and as funding is changing really rapidly around some of those resources kind of as we emerge from the pandemic we're seeing a lot more people coming in and asking us those types of questions like mm -hmm. i can't get a hold of my caseworker um, and I really need to know what's happening with my emergency rental assistance money wow. because I don't know if I'm going get to get a get get that benefit next month and types and questions like that. So we're doing more of that type of work. 
Um, and then, then we had been doing for a while, we're starting to see some of our winter season behavior issues come back now, which we hadn't seen since before the pandemic, uh, which are always exciting. Um, so yeah, so it feels it feels a lot like a return to a return to some sort of normal, some semblance of normal, which is which is great. Mm -hmm. Do you have, I mean, the sort of questions that you were just talking yeah. about, rental assistance, I mean, sure. that arguably reference librarians are trained to find any information, but yeah. but uh, do you have folks coming in from other community organizations to volunteer to help meet needs that are outside the normal for you? Not yet. Uh, one of the things that's identified in our strategic plan actually is making more community partnerships. So, and I've done some uh, initial reach outs to organizations that do that work yeah. to see if we can get some partnerships. I'd love to have somebody um, that, who specifically deals with benefits or maybe specifically deals with um, even maybe like a mental health caseworker. Yeah. I would love to have somebody like that in the library on a regular schedule. Oh, yeah. So we're working towards that. Good. Um, yeah, and so and then the, the biggest thing that we're very excited about is our strategic plan. Uh, but the other thing that I also wanted to bring up while I'm here, and I don't want to take too much of your time, is our, um, a number of years ago, we did a capital campaign called Give the Library a Lift to complete 25 deferred, mostly deferred maintenance projects. And we are now 20 down and five to go. We're getting very, very close to having all of those projects done, which is very exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, we're in we're in we're in great shape and we're as as busy as ever. It's been it's it's been it's been kind of great. Yeah, yeah, yeah very exciting. Um, and so I'm here officially uh, to ask you guys to put us on the town meeting warning for level funding with last year. So the amount's forty six thousand dollars seven hundred. It's forty six thousand seven hundred and sixty four dollars. And that's yeah, as I said, the same amount that we requested last year. Judith has a question. Yeah. I, I actually had two, but Carl asked one of my questions. Um, um, going back to the digital books that you've referenced, um, are there agreements or licensing agreements that limit the number of times you can a, a library can check out or allow folks to check out a particular volume before it expires? And if so, how does that inform your acquisitions policy when it comes to digital um, books? Yeah, of course. So yes, uh, it, it, the, the short answer to that is yes. Uh, it depends on the it depends on the title. It depends on the publisher it, it, uh, that created the material. It depends on whether or not it's an audiobook versus an ebook. Um, but there are limitations to how many copies. Uh, by and large, our digital resources act they mirror a physical resource. So if we would have one copy uh, of uh, Demon Copperhead, for example, in the library, we might have one digital copy that is that is now circulating or hopefully, or well, in the, in the case of that particular book, we have multiple copies. Um, but yeah, so there are holds lists, there are wait lists for digital items. There is a, a set number of digital items. Uh, and the way that informs collection development is very much the same way that it informs uh, collection development and acquisitions for a physical title. If our holds list gets too long, then we have the capability to buy digital copies of an item that only our patrons can check out. So if I see some of those holds lists getting very, very long, uh, then I can, I can spend the money and purchase additional copies or additional loans of a specific copy or, or simultaneous yeah. uses. But in terms of the um, the digital, for lack of a better term, book itself, there it is. Are there any limitations on how many times uh, you can check it out? I understand that only one person at a time can have access to it. But after you reach, say, twenty five or fifty, it is it like a used book and it goes away? Yes. Uh, uh, again, like that depends. Uh, so some of our some of our books act like that and some don't. Um, it's yeah. frequently 40 uses per title yeah. if we if we buy like a limited licensure. And so if you use it 40 times, gets used 40 times, then, then it goes away. Poof. Yep. Huh. Unless I buy it again. Oh, I see. Yep. So uh -huh. I can I can continue. It's a way for them to keep making money basically without you using it too much. 
basically. Basically, yeah. 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 And a physical and, book, how many times can a physical book go out the way it's treated generally by lenders? Um, probably double that anyway. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's treated well, I think it could probably go out a hundred times. Yeah. yeah. And what's it cost you for the book? I, I, have a book it it, I mean, yeah, it depends. A, like a, a digital copy. Though. Oh, a digital copy? It yeah. varies really widely. But, it does. But um, something in the neighborhood of... Forty-five to fifty dollars, oh, maybe. Not too. It's not. No, it's not like thousands of dollars for something like that. No, but, but it would, it costs you about the same for a hardcover book. A hardcover book costs us maybe fifteen to twenty. Oh, really? So it's still cheaper. Oh, no kidding. Okay. That's your purchase price. That's right? our you, purchase price. Yeah, right? you're it's buying. We've it. processed it. Exactly. And whatnot. Yeah, exactly. Then it is probably pretty similar. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So your finances are in good shape, is what you're saying. Our finances are in very good shape. Yeah. I think we're probably as solid as I've ever. I've been at the library six and a half years, and I think our finances are as or more solid than I've ever seen them. Huh. Yeah, we've uh, put my my co-director Jesse and my predecessor Tom McCone, um, but, you know, but really particularly Jesse and the trustees have put a tremendous amount of time into making our finances very very solid. We're current on our audits. We're on a five year audit cycle. Uh, we have um, reserve accounts funded. So one of the things that we saw with this last round of capital campaigns and all and this deferred maintenance that we're now finally just about to finish up, um, now we have part of that was to fully fund a maintenance reserve. And so now we have a buffer against some of these larger projects. So when our roof needs replacing, it's not all of a sudden a yeah. crisis in our annual operating. Right, budget. right. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, so our finances are in really good shape. Huh. Yeah. And, but, you know, many businesses have had a lot of increased expenses in the last year. Yeah. You've had those and you're able to absorb them. We I were, mean, salaries. Yeah. I mean, well, so we're on uh, our salaries when inflation went crazy in yeah. the past year. Uh, we didn't see that uh, impact our salaries as much, at least yet, oh. um, because we uh, have our, our staff is unionized. We're a union shop. Yeah. Uh, and we have an inflation cap built into our union contract. Oh. So, uh, huh. yeah. So it capped out at the maximum. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, and the reason that that exists is to buffer against times right. where we have kind of crazy economic swings. And it also assures staff during low times of inflation that they will get some yes, sort of increase. Yeah, it's just a exactly. steady. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's a way to um, yeah. a budget. And so we have seen increased costs. We are not, we're not immune to in, right. to inflationary so clear, factors, but, but, you are some. but we are a little bit, yeah. You're protected. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay. Well, any more questions? Nope. My door's always open if anybody comes up with anything. I love yeah. I love answering questions. Yeah, it's easier to answer. <laughs> <laughs> bring them, bring them at me. Yeah. Well, I think we're in pretty good shape. I mean, we appreciate the fact that it's a level funded budget, which everyone will appreciate. Yeah. <clears throat> so. well, and it's an appreciated resource. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks. By East Montpelier especially, are we are we best in class in terms of usage per capita? I did not actually calculate out oh, usage okay. per capita, okay. but you guys are always right up there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, fishing for compliments for the I guess so. Yeah. Your name in a minute. Why did you? Well, thank you for coming in. Yeah, yeah thanks thank for coming in. And our next budget discussion is Montpelier Senior Activity Center. And, okay. I'm here online. <laughs> online, that's that's good. I mean, whatever works for you. Online works for us. So, can uh, you see and you hear have, me okay? Yeah, we can yep. hear you and you have the floor. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I had my kiddos to contend with this evening. Um, so I'm Sarah Lipton. I'm the director at the Montpelier Senior Activity Center. I've been director for just over a year. Um, I believe you probably saw my predecessor, Jana Klar, last year. So I'm really happy to be with you today for the first time. We have had quite an interesting year, um, the Senior Center. We had a lot of staff turnover this past year. And so it's been a, a lot of juggling to make sure that we're taking care of everything that needs to be taken care of. But Needless to say, we've done a lot of growth in the last year. 
We've got a, a pretty full staff at this point, and we've seen a pretty incredible growth to our Feast Senior Meals program. We provide meals on wheels to Montpelier and Berlin, um, older adult residents who are homebound and need access to meals. And that doesn't really touch your community so much, but I just want to point out that it's pretty amazing what's happening right now in our community. The need for meals is increasing dramatically. We've had about a 70% increase in need for meals this past year. So we've been working wow. really hard to wow. figure that out. It feels like a big nut to crack um, in terms of funding and ability to provide all of the meals that are needed, but we're working really hard on it. And I feel really confident that in 2023, we will be able to figure that out. We have continued to be able to offer our curbside meals and um, many of your residents come to those every week on Tuesdays and Fridays to pick up a meal and take home or share with um, someone they're living with or you know, just to be able to have a meal. We did try to start doing congregate meals again. Um, we're going to continue to try. It's it's really hit or miss. You know, Similar to the library, we've had a, a sort of resurgence of people coming back in the building, but at the same time, there's still a lot of reticence. So it's a combination of trying to respond to what everyone wants, which is to be able to come back and engage, but at the same time, making sure that we have a safe, you know, healthy environment to offer for our older adult community. Our classes, which many of your residents um, mm -hmm. attend online and in person, have grown. We have been able to just about double the amount of classes that we offered from the pandemic time, which I'm really pleased to see. We've got many new teachers on our roster and lots of students. We've, I think, I forget the numbers, but I, th I think it was, we about doubled also. I think during the height of the pandemic, we had a uh, just under 20 classes and about 300 people taking classes. And this past semester, the current one that's ending this week, actually, we have about just over 50 classes and over 600 students. So that's a pretty awesome thing to see happening, that people are really engaging in adult education, whether it's, you know, active living and wellness classes. We've got some dance classes on the docket. We have, I think, five or six different kinds of art classes, a whole slew of humanities classes, um, including classes over at the Savoy Theater, which a lot of people really love to do. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. Um, we also have a new Monday morning coffee and conversation drop-in group. Um, we've got Oh gosh, so many new drop-in groups coming up in January. Uh, there's a, a really hilariously titled uh, drumming class called the Rhythm Method. Um, we have our trash tramps that are going out every Tuesday to collect their litter on the curb. Uh, we've got, I think, four different musical drop-in groups, at least four different game drop-in groups. We still have our Savoy Lending Library of DVDs. We have our books that we lend out. The list goes on. We've got a puzzle corner for people to take puzzles home. Um, and we are also getting ready to start a new tech cafe. We've been working in partnership with the Montpelier High School and um, an organization called All Brains Belong, who has been teaching high school students how to offer tech support and training to older adults. It's a very cool partnership. And so we'll be starting in January with a focus group under uh, January 5th. So if you have anyone who wants to come and learn or let us know rather what they want us to teach them, then we'll start teaching them. Um, and we finally have a volunteer through the Central Vermont Refugee Action Network, actually, who is helping us to onboard a number of iPads that we were gifted last year so that we'll have those to lend out and offer tech support and training through those devices. Trying to go through my mental list. What are all the things? Um, we, you know, we're in appeal seasons. We just sent out our appeal. We're, we've got our monthly newsletter going on. We have a wonderful new, as of this year, communications and development coordinator, Matt Wilson. Wonderful new staff in the kitchen. Eli Mutino is our new feast program manager. Um, chef Shalanda James is our kitchen manager chef. We have a new part-time kitchen assistant, Robbie Plunkett. Um, I think that's, that's, all of our new staff. And then we have a number of other staff that we're working with through the Department of Labor and also um, Associates for Development Training. So I can pause there if you have any questions about our activities before I dive into budget land. Any questions? No, I'm fire hosing, sorry. 
<laughs> I'll keep going, I think. I don't see okay. Anything. All right. I'll keep going. So, I'm rolling. Um, all right. So yeah, we've been serving, we generally serve about 1600 older adults in our community and it's not just East Montpelier and Berlin and Montpelier, but it's also, you know, Moortown, Callis, Middlesex, uh, Worcester, um, who am I forgetting? Berlin. There's, you know, all of the surrounding towns um, come in and, and have been participating in our classes and our um, drop-in groups in discussion groups. Oh, I forgot the whole Ollie series. We have um, been hosting in partnership with UVM's old, was it Osher? I always forget what it stands for. Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Um, and those were very well attended this fall um, with 50 and 60 and 70 people coming out to hear an amazing array of speakers and presentations. And those will get started again in February um, with a really exciting lineup of presentations. Um, we've also been doing um, more collaboration. I'm a huge fan. I was excited to hear Carolyn talk about um, collaborative partnerships because I that's one of my favorite things to build. And so I actually have been working really closely with Michelle Singer at the library on making sure that we're doing um, events together and in coordination. And we did quite a number this past year and we will again in the coming year. And we are also working with um, a new collaboration with the Pride Center of Vermont and the Rainbow Umbrella of Central Vermont group to offer more LGBTQ events for older adults. I think we're going to be doing a drag bingo evening. Um, we've got some queer poetry events and I'm also starting to work with the Summit School of Montpelier, the music school, to offer, um, probably get started in maybe in April, a new coffee house so we can have an open mic and drop in um, featured performers and folks from the community can come and present um, so we've been doing a lot of collaborative work to really bring out what we do to more people and bring in more people who are doing similar things because we really feel that we, we have a, an incredible opportunity to be part of the city of Montpelier. We are one of very few senior centers that are actually run through the munis municipality and we're one of the only senior centers, um, that's run that way and running a senior nutrition program. So it feels, we really feel like we have this incredible opportunity to be able to have a lot of impact for older adults in our community. And so what we're looking ahead at at FY24 with the budget um, is we do need to ask for a slight increase, a 7.7% increase. And that's because the city has been doing an increase um, around for each department which was uh, the baseline was 7.7, .7, but they actually wound up um, essentially giving us an 18% increase um, in recognition of all the work that we're doing for the community, which was kind of unheard of and amazing. So we're not asking you for an 18% increase, um, but we do need, but there's a policy in place with the city that if, if we are getting an increase from the city, we have to ask our surrounding supporting towns for an increase as well. And, and really what that will go to is making sure that we're continuing to offer excellent programming for your residents. You know, one of the things that I'm really invested in as I have these conversations with our surrounding towns is finding out what, what do your people want? You know, can is there anything we can do in East Montpelier? Is there something that we could come out and offer to your community? Is there something that you would want to do specifically with us? And I'd love to follow up and whoever it is I should have that conversation with, have that conversation. Uh, I'm talking with Worcester, for instance, um, about doing events again at their old town hall and Callis as well at their renovated town hall. Um, so that's that's kind of what we're looking at. And I'm wide open for questions. So you say level funding here and your request, but you're actually going more? Oh, there's a, you should have the updated version. Oh, okay. I, don't have, I have the, yeah, I have in the, the 9,000. That's what I have. It says level fund. Request. Yeah. And it was 9,000 last year as well. Unless I, right. That was, so I did. So, uh, shoot. Um, I apologize. I sent it to Gina last week or the week before. Oh. We, I did put together a level funded request and then I had to go through the city's budget cycle and found out about the increases. And so then I reframed and I, ha I had to, and I apologize for that, um, redo my request and ask for an increase. You don't yeah, have that updated, you don't yeah. have those updated forms? Somehow I, yeah, somehow I didn't have that. So it's seven point something percent of 9,000? So it's, yeah, it's nine nine 9,700 is the request. Yeah. And every town is getting uh, an increased request? 
yes, every town is getting the 7.7 .7 increased okay. request. Yep. So and I can tell you what those numbers are if that's helpful. It's all on all my right. form. I can do the math. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That'd I'll make sure you, I'll thing. resend it to Gina. I'm really sorry yeah, you didn't do that. Please. Yeah, that'd be great. Yep, absolutely. So and not giving a hard time. It's just that when you said we're going to go with an increase and then I'm on the paper. Well, I'm yeah, happy. no, I understand. That's how I'm, just starting I'm like, am I screwing something up here? I thought maybe I was seeing. No, I, I really thought I sent, I mean, I did send it, but I'm sorry you don't have it in front of you. Um, so I'll make sure you get those materials this evening. Okay. Any other questions? Um... Well, if you, if you can figure out how um, some of the other towns are approaching their seniors and coming up with activities that seniors want, let us know how they're doing it. Because I, I think because we're so close to Montpelier that seniors can more easily get to Montpelier from here than maybe they can in Calais and some of the other places. Mm -hmm. But I haven't figured out how we find out what people really want. Well, they need. go to Twin Valley. Too, they right? do. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the ways that I've been trying to solve that puzzle is by having gatherings with folks, mm -hmm. inviting people to actually meet me online or in person so that I can hear from them. What do you want? And a lot of what I'm hearing is conversation. People want conversation. People want to be able to, whether it's a specific topic like the Ollie lecture, a lot of people were coming out to that. <laughs> or last year, I forgot to mention one other thing we did. We ran a farm stand um, with events outside, both musical and educational events with the farm. We have the Montpelier Feast Farm that the Parks Department runs to grow food produce for our feast kitchen. And they had some surplus. And so we were able to offer like $1 for a piece of you know a produce, but have events alongside that. And I think that what we're noticing is the coming out of the pandemic, the hardest thing that has hit people besides a lot of increased food insecurity is really the social isolation. Mm -hmm. So really looking for sometimes really even simple ways for people to come together. It could be a craft group. It could be a coffee group. It could be, you know, a book group. It could be something really simple <clears throat> that allows people to come together and connect again. And I think that's, that's one of the main things. And the other, the other component I think is, is volunteering, like working together for something. You know, that there's sort of that common sense of, okay, we're doing something for good in the community. And I would be more than happy. I don't know if you have like a town hall kind of gathering space, really, or I mean, I've driven through all the parts of East Montpelier, but I don't, I don't know. Do you have a town hall space that we no. could create a little gathering at or not really? Not really, but sort of. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is basically our town hall, but I mean, it's too small for the kind of right that you'd want to have. The town well, hall. I would be town. very open to a longer conversation about what we could do together. I'd be very happy to help create some more engagement. I was I mean, thinking that maybe even a short survey at town meeting might help. Yeah, yeah for sure. Sure. The people who go to town meeting are generally mm -hmm. fairly local. Yeah. So they'd be willing to, you know, fill in, maybe do like a five question survey or something. Mm -hmm. Something open ended as well. Yeah. Yeah. But it looks like you've got less people from East Montpelier now. You said 87. Yeah, it, I mean, everything dropped off with the pandemic. That's yeah. just the reality of what happened. We were down to very skeletal operations, and that was before I was there, but it was very, very limited what we were able to offer. And so 2021, we were sort of slowly inching back up a little bit, and then it's been this past year, 2022, that we've been able to really expand again. But I still, as I mentioned, there's still a lot of reticence um, for coming out to things, yeah. and it's just slower, you know, it's just a slower pace, but it feels like, I mean, if, if you were to come in in the last few weeks to the senior center, it has felt very busy. So it feels like people are sort of, even though COVID is definitely still real, I have two staff members out with it right now. Um, and it's, you know, it's totally still real, but it feels like we're inching our way just the way the library was describing, you know, inching our way back to not pre pandemic levels, but a sense of, okay, this is, we can do this again. We want to come out again. So yes, the numbers have been lower, um, but it's still, it still feels like there's a lot of people coming in and, and engaging with things. Yes, Carl. Speaking of bringing things out to the community, uh, Sarah, you mentioned a couple of times in your report 
Uh, I'm not sure whether you mentioned in the fire hose just now and, and I missed it, but uh, the village initiative that yes. you guys have, I find very interesting. And you say in your report, you're uh, thinking about expanding it to East Montpelier. Can you tell us more about that, please? I sure can. It's a slightly unfortunate update, though. So the um, the village model that we launched in 2020 um, was by having hiring an AmeriCorps service member to operate the program, which we called MSEC at home. And we had an AmeriCorps service member for that year, 2020 to 2021. We had one for 21 to 22. And then this summer, when we were blasting everywhere that we were looking for an AmeriCorps service member, we got zero applicants. So the program is a bit at a standstill. However, we have two possible ways to kind of get around not having an MSAC at home person to organize it. The tech cafe program that we're establishing with the high school and all brains belong and some support from. Uh, the refugee community, that's going to enable us to do some of the work that the um, the AmeriCorps person was doing, which was offering tech support. So two years ago, our AmeriCorps service member, Andrew Gribben, who was awesome, that was a, the primary function that he, he filled, was doing tech support for folks. And so without him there, and last year, our AmeriCorps person didn't have any tech experience, so she really didn't do that. So we're really happy that we've got this collaboration coming in very soon in January to start kind of bringing back that component. And then the other thing is we're actually just about to apply for a grant through Meals on Wheels America for a um, at-home repairs project, which is another component of the MSAC at Home program. And a volunteer just came out of the community, actually, really generously. He's retired, and he retired to this area so that he could be a volunteer carpenter. And so he actually, of his own generosity, went and got himself paid for his insurance. And so starting in January, we will have him in place. As long as we can get this grant to pay for materials, then we'll have that to be able to offer out to the community. Um, what our hopes for MSAC at home are, if we can ever find an AmeriCorps person again, is to be able to build a cadre of volunteers from within the community who then go out and do at home support services, you know, whether it's repairs at home or, you know, hey, I just can't reach this thing on the top shelf or putting up blinds or whatever kind of random service project. So that's just at a standstill until we can find another AmeriCorps person. I've, we've kept it in the budget. Um, that line is it still in the budget so that we're hopeful for the future to have another AmeriCorps member. And we suspect the reason is a combination of sh housing shortages and, um, and the high cost of living versus the super low cost of the wages that AmeriCorps offers. So mm. we're a little bit on pause, but kind of not entirely. Okay. That answers your question. <laughs> and thank you for that. And just for context, the village initiative is, uh, as you say in your report, it's an uh, aging in place initiative yep. to help people. Exactly. Do that. And it's part of a network of uh, a couple hundred such villages around the country. It is, yeah. And we're part of the village to village network. And we have a new database ready to go once we have someone to run it um, called Help. Uh, is it Help My Village or? Oh no, helpful village. <laughs> um, so we're ready. We're ready. We just don't have the person. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? We're just running a bit behind. So we've I'm got sorry. a lot of people to present budget discussion. So yeah. any more questions for no. Sarah? Oh, no. We're good? Yeah. Okay. Thank well, you thank all you. so very much. Thanks for yeah, coming. Thank you. Send, send us those updated um, Absolutely. Materials. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so the next um, budget discussion is Central Vermont Health and Hospice. Home health. <laughs> health and hospice. Home health. Not home health. Vermont home. Health and Hospice. Home health and hospice. Home health and hospice. I am glad to be oh, here in person. Oh, it is home. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you huh? want me to wear my mask? Yeah. I prefer it, but it uh, okay. you know, doesn't matter to me. It's up to you. Sorry. I'm fine doing that. Okay. Here we go. Okay. I think I've got some materials here. 
So it is all hell. Okay. Yeah. Oh, is that it? Okay. So. Yeah. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, for the record, you're Sandy Roe. I yeah, sorry. Hi, I'm Sandy Roos. I am the president and CEO of Central yeah. Vermont Home Health and Hospice. Very familiar with some of the faces, both yeah. in the room and online. So I have a short presentation to go through. I'm going to skip through some of it. I'm not going to read it all. A lot yeah. of you know us and who we are and what we do. Yeah. Um, so anyways, so first thing for um, just about our mission, I'm not necessarily going to read the mission to you because I think you're pretty familiar with that. But one thing to keep in mind is we are mandated under regulation for designation and operation of home health agencies in the state of Vermont. And what that means is we have to accept all referrals for home health, hospice, and choices for care programs. Oh. So if we get a referral, we don't really have the option to say no. If we do say no for regulation, we have to hire lawyers, figure out why we're saying no, go through a whole process, and more than likely a surveyor will be on our doorstep the next day. So <laughs> um, pretty tight, pretty tight rules. It also limits our ability to negotiate with payers to a degree. So in a hospital setting, sometimes you can say, we're not going to accept these rates. Yeah. And we're not going to sign the contract until we need, can negotiate better. For home health and hospice, based on these rules that I just mentioned, we can't do that very easily. And so right now we're working with one contract that is paying us $100 less per visit um, compared to all the other payers. And it's pretty ridiculous. And it's a small number of individuals that we serve with that payer source, and we lose a half a million dollars on it wow. for 36 people. Wow. <laughs> Ouch. So yeah, so um, just some things that are happening from that perspective. For East Montpelier residents, we pretty much um, have serviced a, a little bit, a few more individuals um, than we did last year. And I have a couple numbers here. We have seen an increase in long-term care clients that we serve in East Montpelier. Those are individuals that we really want to keep home. This program is really that last step before they have to actually go into some sort of facility. So that's really maintaining their independence. Personal care attendants serve that population. We saw a 43% increase in those individuals this yeah. past year. Wow. Um, we also saw an additional, we, last year we saw the same, but also an increase in our maternal and child health services. And we'll talk about those services a little bit later. But those are really services that follow um, a pregnant mom pre-birth um, all the way through pregnancy, really works with the individual on parenthood, works with the child, developing healthy lifestyles. We follow those children, some up to two years old, depending on the program, some up until five years old. And we certainly partner with a lot of other community providers with that care. Um, just over the past several years, we've increased the number of patients served for East Montpelier by 28%. And we also increased the number of admissions by close to 40%. What's an admission? Um, where somebody comes on to care for like an episode of care. It can be 30 days, 60 days, sometimes it's longer, mm -hmm. but sometimes they'll come on and then they go off, mm -hmm. and then they come back. So it's counted twice, whereas patients serve is counted once. Okay, thank you. Um, so innovation. So some of our work is we try to be innovative in our telemonitoring and telehealth services have been significant, especially through the pandemic. We were doing telemonitoring starting in 2007. The interesting part about this program, it is, is not reimbursed by any payer. So this is a program that we've chosen to invest in um, for lots of reasons and certainly paid off during the COVID pandemic, but it allows us to keep eyes on individuals. And sometimes you can call an, a client and just check in on them. You can't see their face. When you're on telehealth, you can visually see them and that speaks volumes to a nurse that can assess that. Um, we have been working to develop different programs with our um, physician and um, hospital community. The latest one we developed was an evidence-based program in collaboration with Central Vermont Medical Center's cardiology team. And their team actually has access to their patient panel that we ma manage in our, under our telemonitoring program, which is great because they can go in and document notes, 
we can go, you know, they can see everything we're doing so we can really collaborate and coordinate on these high risk patients. Most times these are individuals that are going back and forth to the hospital. Mm -hmm. We want to keep them out. Um, this particular, these individuals um, have heart failure. And really, we look for signs of exacerbation where they're having weight gain or retaining fluid, um, et cetera. And really, the goal is to work with the physician practice to draw their dried blood, draw their blood um, first thing in the morning. We monitor that. We implement diuretics. And there's a close monitoring, and we try to keep them out of the hospital. So we do this very close monitoring over four to six days. And we just recently had another success. So keeping them out of the hospital, keeping them at home, being able to do that real time, kind of in really individualized care is really critical. So it's it's very much in the early stages, but we're seeing um, lots of success. So how are you paying for this? So we actually raised dollars through fundraising and we use some of our town funding. And then we also use some investment income from our, our investment portfolio. Um, next page, Care to Help Families Thrive. So this is about the work related to our maternal and child health program. These programs are Medicaid funded. We're paid 40 cents on a dollar. Um, it was a little bit higher last year. This past year, um, it was a little bit less, <laughs> which isn't unusual for Medicaid. And we're also doing another collaboration with the physician community at Central Vermont Medical Center related to perinatal um, visits. So ultimately, the OB practice follows these individuals, and then the maternal and child health nurse comes in at about 30 weeks. They may be working with them up to that point, and we do at no cost to the client or provider because some insurances don't necessarily cover this work, but it's actually something that really helps set the tone for that parent and that child moving forward. And it really focuses on perinatal mood anxiety disorder with the mom and also social determinants of health. Because there's been studies that found that the mood anxiety disorder, post birth, really shows up and things kind of start to spiral down in the family environment. So we're working with a practice on that. We make necessary referrals to other community providers and or physicians. And we also supply, um, provide lactation support to those moms who really encourage breastfeeding. And then just some other programs. Um, ultimately, you know, this is uh, the maternal early childhood sustained home visiting program is one that provides nurse support to families with parenthood, with pregnancy, post birth, and follows that child up to two years old. There's another component to that program that follows the child up to five years old. So really based a lot on family needs and what other things they have, whether they're followed up to two years or five years. And I think this all goes back to these programs are really about um, trying to start a healthy lifestyle for that child. We hear more and more, we have to invest at a young age to prevent chronic disease in the long term. So this was some of the basis of how we originated as a DNA actually many, many years ago. <laughs> um, we were very involved with the schools and their programs from a nursing perspective. So it's really come full circle that then we kind of switched a bit more to elderly, older adult care, and now we're kind of back and really focusing on these children. So it's all under one umbrella and we can make those shifts as the need arises. Um, just a little bit about that program and our collaboration. Um, our community partner of the year with the Family Center of Washington County. They're a significant partner in this maternal and child health work, um, which is great. It seems like the individuals and the partners and providers that work in this program really do it right. And trying to like model and replicate this across the healthcare system, I think would be awesome. Um, we haven't gotten there yet, but hopefully we at CDHHH can use some of this model to implement in our other programs. Um, we certainly do a lot of outreach and education with our CDHH um, services for community partners and vice versa. We work with Washington County Mental Health. They've done a lot around um, first aid mental health training for our staff. We have staff that are in homes, with individuals that have mental illness for a long period of time. They need that support and help. We also try to work with other partners to make sure we're not duplicating effort 
and we can really um, kind of say, okay, we can do this, we can do that, so we can really um, be a good steward of the dollars that we receive. And then also we made an investment um, over the last couple of years in a complex care coordinator, and that mirrors a little bit of what you'll see in a physician practice. We have so many individuals that have so many needs. I'm sure you've heard this from many others that have come in front of you and just being in the community. But she really works with most of our complex, the, the highest complex clients. And there's like, it went from a small amount to a huge amount after COVID. This is a position that's also only has a small amount of reimbursement through the Accountable Care Organization, one here in Vermont. But what we found is it really helps our staff going into the home because there are so many complexities. She can kind of take that and say, hey, let me do it. You do your visit. You do the coordination you need to and let me do the rest. Mm -hmm. um, she touches over the year probably um, 1,200 clients. She currently probably is touching 300 clients on any given period of time and really collaborates with the community and knows the resources and how to connect individuals to those resources. And then just a little bit about our history with our partnership with East Montpelier. Um, in 2021, 93% of total votes were in favor of our request. It was the same in the prior year, and I think it's been fairly consistent over the years. We're really happy to have that. And really, I think we have a strong collaboration with our East Montpelier EMS team. Um, certainly through COVID, we learned a lot and did a lot together so we could help them be able to just go to um, calls that were truly for emergency services and then cases that we were involved. Um, you know, they give us a call and say, hey, you know, every time we go out, we got to suit up and pull gear. That's not making sense. And then we can't go to emergency services. So and how it, does that work? Somebody calls 911 and yeah. it comes to the and EMS? So it might be like a call you? Yeah. So sometimes it might be a lift assist. Yeah. Sometimes it might be an individual that is on a program where we, we see them more infrequently. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, you know, we've gotten several calls. Lots of times we go. They're not really emergencies right so how can we work together to try to support this individual to prevent them from calling so you've prevented the, the need for yeah the we actually, to go up. yeah we have yeah. monitored the numbers here in Barry city we actually just got through implementing this program through covid and um, we went in, in front of the town uh, the city council and we had reduced a significant number of calls that were considered non-emergency. I'm surprised and delighted that you can do that because yeah. my understanding was that they were required to respond well, to any respond, I think, and they have to do what they need to do. But ultimately what happens is if they know we're involved and they're having they're getting called a lot, it's like, okay, stop, wait yeah. a minute. <laughs> Good. What's happening? Excellent. So I think it's in the very um, baby stages, but we've done it with Barry City and we've been very successful. So we wanted to try to replicate some of that. Hmm. And we've worked with this team with hospice protocols for hospice patients and, you know, what is the transport mm -hmm. situation, et cetera. So we think we have an opportunity to work with a team that's hmm. really willing to try to make some change. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so, I was reading a little bit about some of your um, staffing issues, which is like a lot of people are having. Yeah. Um, do you think that continuing forward, considering your budget, what you pay, um, so on and so forth, that you're going to be able to meet the needs, of the, the growing needs? Of yeah. The so, so one of the things that we did, um, because staffing was so critical mm -hmm. to our services, is we had a lot of traveling clinicians that filled us financially. Um, in 2021, we spent about 1.4 million Ooh. in traveling clinicians. In 2022, we're going to double that. Ooh. Bad morale, not always a good fit, more times than none, lots of administrative overhead. In this year's coming budget, we actually are making a significant shift for our director of staff. It has already been initially approved by our finance committee, but we're investing in our employees because we want people that live in this community to serve our clients. And certainly, um, we rather keep the money in Vermont, too. <laughs> Instead of hiring, like, family nurses exactly. from Louisiana or something. Exactly. Exactly. And for a 13 week stint, that that's really... Right. And the services aren't that good. Right. So exactly. does that mean you're going to pay your, your people more? Yeah. So, um, 
kind of why we need town funds. Um, we recently got hit with a significant Medicare decrease. This is actually the largest one we've had in quite a while. Um, we've had a 42% reduction in Medicare rates since 2011 until now. And now they recently hit us with an 8% reduction. It was going to happen all in one year. It's going to happen over two years. Sure. For our agency, it's a half a million. So when you lose on Medicaid and you lose more on Medicare, you start at zero. <laughs> wow. So, um, but our but our um, finance committee wants to take some of our savings and really make a huge investment in increasing wages for our direct care staff so that we can be competitive or at least a little more competitive with the hospital setting. Because yeah. in central Vermont, that's really the you environment. You think the insurer that really look favorably towards that sort of thing because it prevents people from having to go in the hospital, yeah. which is substantially more costly. Right. Yeah, for people yeah, yeah. Makes sense. exactly. <laughs> it so matter. we lobby with our um, federal delegation. Um, we've recently met with Becca Ballant. Um, our association has met with Peter Welch. Senator Leahy is very supportive. They're very supportive but there's not a lot of action. We're this big and the scene's yeah. not this big. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so we're really making a huge effort at our association level, let alone at our organization. We recently had a legislative breakfast as to where can the state help when you're mostly federally funded, right, with mm -hmm. Medicare. Right. And there are ways they can help us, whether they do that or not will be another story. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly we're looking for that and we're hoping that that'll work. Um, so there, most of the people you, you help are people who who can't leave their homes, or people um, who can periodically leave their homes. Yeah. Like I, what I'm leading up to is is uh, have you have you made any additional efforts, or you, have you initiated efforts to work with like Twin Valley Senior Center and, and yep. Montclair Senior Center because that'd be a great place to see people and do blood pressures and mm -hmm. check them out and see how right. they're doing. So um, from the community health perspective, we have done a lot of that work in the past. Mm -hmm. What we've had to do based on some of the cuts is really look to see, okay, where can we provide that service? Where do others provide it? And we do partner with the senior centers. We actually do foot care clinics. Yeah, okay. I we've expanded to do those, those yeah. like they're going crazy. Right. Um, podiatrists love that we have them. And they're really to, for that real community health part of what we do. Mm -hmm. We did all the work with COVID. We still do mm -hmm. food clinics. Um, from the perspective of like we used to do all the blood pressure screenings and all of that, but if we partner, sometimes we will partner with a senior center, yeah. the different organizations to actually go out and do some right. of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit small in the bigger scheme of things now, it's right. a medical model. Mm -hmm. um, so really in our budget process too, where we're really looking, we, we need to increase our home health program, which serves those older adults that are funded Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance. We have a small amount of private insurance, so the ability to cost shift to those contracts is pretty much zero than that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of in our world mm -hmm. um, a little bit harder. We also have our hospice program. We find that individuals at end of life um, don't tend to get onto that program to really benefit from it soon enough. Of course, it's a really sensitive subject, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately hospice mm -hmm. is about life not about death. And I think so much of what we see now is somebody goes on hospice and then they pass in a few days. Yeah. So as much as support that we can give, the family is great and we get a lot of positive feedback. We'd like that to be a bit longer. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. so I just got a quick question about sure. that. So you look like you're asking for level funding? Correct. But you're taking out your savings to fund the increased salary so you guys yes, to pay yeah. people. Yeah. So, sounds like a little bit of a shoot as far as your budget goes. Right, it is a little bit. So, um, you know, we're not against supporting the Central yeah. Vermont Home and Hospice, obviously, but you think this is going to be a level funding, and then if it doesn't work out, then next year is going to be a big ask. Um, not necessarily. You think no. it work So, out? so what we'll really have to look at is I don't use okay. programming. Um, what we'll really have to look at is programming first. And if there's no reason you don't get reimbursed for it. Yeah. Can we silence that for? Thank you. If there's programming we don't get reimbursed for, then we really have to look at that and see what right. the true impact of it is. Which is what um, happens. Yep. Yep. Um, 
And then um, in addition to that, we do all services. So there's a lot of VNAs that don't do like in Vermont they do, but outside of there. So we're really gonna have to look at that. Yeah. Um, you know, I certainly was presented with um when doing the budget, you know, we might need to cut this. And I'm like, I'm not cutting no gas services. Mm -hmm. There are things that we can do to prevent that right now. It's so, a tough uh, environment though. Seems yeah. like it is. I mean, the traveling nursing is definitely a good idea to get get that going. Yeah, and we'll probably still have some, but we don't want to have them at the level we have them. No. And it's really, it it's it impacts the morale of the staff. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good idea what you're doing. I mean, no question about it. I just question the wisdom of taking it out of your savings. Yep. It's almost better to ask a little bit more money of the towns. Yeah. And to kind of buffer well, that. Yeah. Everybody's not afraid to do that. Right. We're trying to do that. No, you're welcome. But then the end, vital. This is a vital service. So, People understand if you if you ask for a little bit more money, you know, incrementally, it's not such a big shock if it right. work out. That's yeah, and we would we're not, we'd be sensitive. We wouldn't necessarily come with this huge change no, no. because we understand. Yeah, we want you to continue your work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's the bottom line. If we double our contribution, then that's maybe ten percent of the cost of employing a nurse for the year. Mm -hmm. You know, ballpark. Right. So. Well, I, I'm just. I'm just concerned that their path of funding is not mm -hmm. sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's just, but we'll see. Right. We're, I mean, we're, you know more about your budgets than we do, but. We've always been in a place where we've been good stewards of our dollars. So yeah. it's allowing us, you know, we're in a lot better place than some of the VNAs in Vermont. Yeah. We may see some go away. But it's shocking to think that Medicare, well. Medicare funding is dropping. It's outrageous. It's it outrageous. It makes no, no. sense. <laughs> It yeah. makes no sense, and we did. Makes no sense. We did lobby at the federal level. I, I I can't stand it. Like, yeah. So where are our priorities? Not, yeah, I'm pretty persistent. Um, oh, good. <laughs> my first and out of many, but um, you know, our our association has really taken a significant stance, and we're hoping with um some changes in the federal delegation that it'll get a little more attention. Sometimes mm -hmm. the delegation isn't necessarily on the the committees that have a huge amount of impact, although Bernie Sanders is going to be assigned. To a committee that I think can help us. Okay. Well, let's hope so. Yeah. yeah. So when you say half a million dollars in Medicare reimbursement cut, is that nominal? Um, so we're in the budget, yeah. and our primary um, payer is Medicare. Yeah. So currently, I think we are break. Well, I know we are break even with Medicare funding. Um, so it makes it negative at that point without any increases. When we did our initial run of our budget this year, we. Um, modeled out a $3 million operational loss. And we have since worked with it to get it down to about 2 million. Wow. And wow. we projected over the next couple of years, we could potentially break even if we can make some changes in the revenue we take in in certain areas by also um, balancing this wage increase. So my, cost, my question was about that $500,000. Is yep. that nominal dollars or is that inflation adjusted dollars? Uh, that's just nominal. Well, nominal. That's not, right. yeah. Well, yeah. well, we have to move on to the next, but I'm I'm sympathetic to your finances, yeah. and I'm hoping that um your optimism is <laughs> going to pay off. Well, but we'll we, just see, I guess. Yeah, we we've been around a long time, and yeah, I, I feel good about our board and our finance committee. Oh, good. And, and um, perfect. The work we did to come up with what we've done, we yeah. used an external consultant this year that is an industry expert. Mm -hmm. um, he's actually working with several VNAs, not only in Vermont, um, actually most of them outside of Vermont, but in New England. And there are successful organizations like ours that are serving just as many people, if not more, and just really looking as to where do we get lean and where do we, you know, where can we increase revenue to offset some of those expenses? So the next right. few years are going to be tough. Yeah, that's what I think too. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is that you're doing a great service and there's a huge need for it. Mm -hmm. And it's not, that's not going away. Right. That will that's be, not going away. <laughs> that's not going An aging population. It doesn't make sense with Medicare. No, it doesn't. doesn't. In, in, in an aging population, there's going to be an increased need. Right. So it's like, hmm. Okay. But I guess we'll see what happens. Forty-two yeah. percent of Vermont's population is, is reaching at least the age of fifty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. crazy. 
So there's, there's going to be a substantial increase of people. Oh, yeah. Well, right. we've known that for years. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can't understand why, how these, these the federal agencies can cut funding. Yeah. Well, so it's just misplaced priority. It's right. what it is. A lot of what they do is they look at the revenue side and they have to keep it budget neutral. Yeah. But they clearly haven't looked at the expense side. I mean, wage inflation alone is over 8%. They so. give money to causes. Age inflation. Sure this one. Wage inflation. Oh, I think it's age. <laughs> well, it's the most interesting discussion, but we got other people, yeah. unfortunately, to talk to. But thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to next year. Yeah. 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 We've we'll got good people to talk to. Yeah. All right. Well, that was great. What's that? <laughs> Great hair. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for all the work. Yeah, thank involved. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, okay. The next item is the World RPT. Yeah. And GMT. So Jesse cannot be here. Um, okay. Received an email, had a death of the family. Yeah. So okay. um, cannot be in attendance. I'm not sure with Jamie Smith. I don't see a Jamie Smith on. So Jamie Smith. Um, that's with GMT. Oh. Both of the organizations are requesting level funding. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um and have provided materials, which we can certainly review. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Well, I'm I'm comfortable with the funding we have. For sure, yeah, being on the town ballot, they've been on the town ballot for years. And yeah, we're very comfortable with putting that on there. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and review the documents that are ledger. We've got documents that we can review. So, yeah, Jesse was very upset, but I let her know that the board would certainly understand that. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, we understand, yeah. and uh, the board would appreciate that family time is more important in absolutely. the situation. So, yeah, yeah, and and we're very comfortable putting it on the town one. So. Yeah. Um, we always have a very robust conversation at this level, and we sometimes do at town meetings. And we have the same question that comes up over always, and over again. Always. We answer it. And we always say, do you double count? Yeah. <laughs> there and, is, and Kyle always says, well, I pick up the bus in Montpelier. <laughs> <laughs> Are you counting me as the East Montpelier resident? Is that correct? Good. He says it just <laughs> like that. Yeah. Green Mountain grants it uh, has a line in the funding um, request yes. committee yes. as well. And yes. people look at that list and then okay. look at the other article and they say, why yeah. are we doing it twice for GMT? Okay. So yeah. that, that'll come up again. Always. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Always does. But that's fine. Okay. So. The next one is Twin Valley Seniors, and that's with Gene, it looks like. <laughs> Gene is not. Or he said Dean. George. He's not coming. Gene is not available. I'm George Bolenbach. I'm the treasurer of Twin Valley Seniors. Okay. I'll try and answer any questions you have. Okay. A request, um, a request for funding is based on a couple of things. Look, I'm the treasurer and numbers are my game. Part of the problem is that our income has gone down and our expenses have gone up. Okay. For example, last year, the last fiscal year, our expenses increased by 12%. Mm -hmm. And our income was down by 23%. Wow. wow. And we're still trying to provide the same right. services and increase our services to yeah. the community. It's a bit, you know, it's a difficult time. We've not asked for an increase in the past years. We're just seeking a, an increase to really recognize that the cost of doing business has increased. Mm -hmm. What oh. are the oh. <laughs> what, what, what are the funding sources that have gone down, and do you know why they have gone down? Same question I was going to ask. Part later. of the part of the funding in, decrease has been in donations, and that may be due to tax tax things that have changed. Um, the other is that 
in COVID, we received a lot of money that was one-time thing because of COVID, and it's not there anymore. And that's that's a big part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So how does that compare to the year before with the NJ COVID? Okay. In, in, in the past, in the fiscal year that just ended 9-30-22, we were down 12% or our, I'm sorry, our expenses increased by 12% for the year. Our income was down 23%. But that's figuring COVID money was no longer available. Right. And that's, so, and that's why I would I sort of sort of key in on the expenses, which are similar from year to year, being yeah. increased by 12%. Yeah, but your you income know, fluctuates, sounds like. As an example, the drivers who deliver the meals on wheels to the community, they don't charge, we don't, they're not paid for their time per se but they are reimbursed for their mileage. Yeah. And from year to year, the increase was 49% in what we paid in reimbursement to the drivers. It's, you know. Yeah. And utilities for the facility increased by 18%. Yeah. It's just... An example, or not an example, it's just the fact that everything costs more and we really don't have the increase in funding to offset these increases. Right. Well, we certainly understand the inflationary pressures that everyone deals with, and I'm sure Twin Valley deals with them just like everyone else does. A lot of uh, so, that, you know. Okay, so any more questions of this uh, treasurer of Twin Valley seniors? Well, I, I we're kind of familiar, pretty familiar with them anyway, yeah. having yeah. a few meetings on this year. Oh yeah. So we're, and we, we support general in general what the organization does for the seniors in East Montpelier and everywhere else. It's awesome. They have a huge uh, meal program, they have exercise classes, they offer a lot, and uh, we've always been very supportive. Yeah. Uh, Twin Valley. So um, we have no problem with putting this on our uh, town meeting warning. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Yeah. Um, any more questions? I don't see any. What's up? Okay. We're good to go. Well, thank you for coming in. And uh, yeah, I mean, waiting I, for us. I agree that, that I have no problem putting this on the town meeting warning, yeah. but um, you know, we are a board and, uh, and we speak as a group. So I'd appreciate it if you checked in. Saying that we have no problem putting it on the wall. I just asked everybody if they had any questions. That, uh, Thank you again. Yeah. And you didn't say anything. Um, that's different than deliberating. Okay. Does well, anyone, does anyone have any objections to putting this on the warning? Thank you for the correction. Yes. Thank you. Okay. No. No. Well, I guess we'll, we don't have any questions. Thank you. We haven't decided whether to put it on the warning yet from what Carl is saying. But thank you for coming in. No, I think all we have to do is just say we don't have a problem with it going on the warning. Well, you don't. I don't, but I probably you. I don't. No. Oh. Okay, so I guess it's unanimous. It's yeah. unanimous. Is it it no, what about uh, yeah. Judith? Do you have no problem. Okay. No. okay. no problem. Okay. And Amy, we haven't heard from Amy. Just, I, just said no problem. I just said no problem. Okay. She just coughed and no problem. Oh, I don't <laughs> okay. I've had problems, but not that. Well, thank you. Thank you. We probably ought to move on to the next item. Yeah. And just a Jamie Smith um, was without power and just got power oh. back on and sent an email. So Jamie has joined, but okay. I did respond to the email and let both know that the the board was comfortable with uh, the organizations what they provided. Mm -hmm. But but Jamie Smith, <laughs> we would like to hear them. Oh, I just I just wanted to hop on and, and thank everybody for that support and to let you know that um, based on what I sent last year, which was, you know, 36 rides, the ridership in East Montpelier on the special services has increased significantly to over 600 rides um, wow. last fiscal wow. year. So, <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a huge increase in, in that special services um, and the US two commuter ridership just on the run that we operate 
was um, over 600, which was down from previous fiscal years, but that's still sort of in line with what we're seeing um, with the pandemic. Okay. Anybody have any more questions of Jamie? Okay. This has to do with the item before. Between yeah, Dallas. sorry for being late. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Glad you got your power back. Yeah. I know it's it's off and on, so I'm happy too. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you for tuning in. And does everyone agree that we should put this on the town warning? The RCT request? I think we already yeah, asked that. We already did. We already yeah, asked that. So I'll make sure. Okay. Okay. So we're going to move on just because we have a lot of people waiting. Um, the Twin Valley Seniors is done. List your things. The next report we have, have to hear. And yeah. Carl, just so you know, I have up with, that set me something after the meeting started, but it is oh. on the website. Okay. You Thank you. Okay. So the next item on agenda is the Lister's year-end report. So yeah. Judith and Amy, this is on the website. I loaded it on the website while the meeting, while we were in the meeting. So you may need to refresh that page, but the attachment is on the website now. Okay. May we approach the bench? Mm -hmm. Uh sure. We're just reading over your report. Oh, but, um, all right. Go ahead and read it. But you can approach That's the bench. Are you, um, is there something you would like to say? Well, if there is, come on up. Yes, yeah, the high points are the listeners compiled a list of the stuff we did this year just to give you an idea of the scope. Like, you know, there were 92 transfers and 36 of them would seem like they're Dallas sales. So they're going to be part of the equalization study that affects our CLA this year. And I keep refreshing, I like refreshing the website, keep refreshing that equalization study website on the tech department page, but they haven't posted it yet. And I think they're a little late this year, but so we don't know if our CLA is going to trigger a required reappraisal yet, but it's in the not too distant future, so we should be anticipating it. Yeah. And we've got like $135,000 or so in the grand list reappraisal fund. So we're funding, you know, that as we go along every year with money from the state. How much does that usually cost to have the well basal usually? I mean, the last time we had one time was 2009, so we can't use that as a judgment. You know, to judge was that the last one? Yeah, I remember. Mm -hmm. Not, it seemed like it was more 2009. 2009? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but do you know how much it costs? That one costs, yeah. No, I don't. It's over a hundred thousand. It was over a hundred back then. Yeah, well, I don't remember that was that much. Well, we can look it up. I can look up for it as long as it's not at the moment. Well, I'm curious, but the hell I had one had, um, had a reappraisal done in about something like four years eight, ago. So we yeah, didn't build how much. Well, it was, well, yeah, if somebody's good in that. It's, it's it. like $85 for the number of particle, um, number parcels. Of parcels we have. Like oh, $85 per parcel. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. What, over 1,200 parcels, right? Well, it's 13. More than, yeah. That's 100,000. Yeah. Right. There you go. go. <laughs> Just often. I mean, they, they do a site visit to every single one, and the yeah. ones are, you know, yeah. different things. Huh. <clears throat> well, I guess we've got money to do that. Yeah. Right. Um, we sent out 110 change of appraisal letters, and we had only three grievances, so that felt pretty good. And 104 current use change letters. Most of the time, all the kinks have been worked out of it by the time a letter goes out. Um, you know, work on tax bills. You can look at the list here. The um, grand list, I printed out the final grand list and I compared it to the as bill, which is the one that you were given in August. So you can set the tax rate. And I swear I have to check this number, but it is 21 cent difference between August 8th and today. <laughs> wow. Because even though the tax exemption for Spring Valley was increased, so that decreased the grand list. There were other changes that increased it, and the difference yeah. was 21 cents on the municipal side. It was $450 on the education side, and that's because of the late HS 1.2 homestead declaration filers. Yeah. And, you know, they increased their value relative to the fact that they had 
Here's something you should know about, which is the gully jumpers. We reviewed all the tax exempt properties and that one stuck out because it was voted. And normally when you vote it, you vote for a 10 year period. And then you're required by statute after that 10 years expires to re-vote every five years. Oh. And this one was voted in 2002, 2001, two, back, way back, March 5th, 2002. And you can see it, I underlined the part on the floor, it was amended to say, so long as it's used for nonprofit recreational purposes. So the town basically said, we don't want to keep voting on this, just as long as they keep using it for that. But really the statute says it's got to be on the warning every five years. So we think you should put it on the warning. Because technically we can't extend them. I wondered what that was. I mean, I wondered who owned that. It's the trails and the gully jumpers. And we thought about giving them tax I thought it was the trails, but I didn't realize the gully jumpers had a And the problem with us granting them tax yeah. exemption the way we did between Valley is that they have to be a 401c3. And the trails is, but the gully jumpers is a 401c7, which oh. is a recreational thing as opposed to a pious charitable. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't technically qualify. The dolly jumpers. Yeah. Huh. But then I mean, you do qualify for voting, and it's a $2,400 value to that property. I looked at it. So, what's the tax on $2,400? Loss. Not very much. <laughs> Not very yeah, much. Yeah, right. So, yeah, so it's 50 bucks. bucks. Yeah. 50 bucks. Exactly. Well, a little bit less. So, it doesn't seem like a big no. problem. No, no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I was wondering who owned that. You know, I'm like, who owned that old piece of property there? You know, because I see cars parked there. Is that where they're going the trail to? The opposite of the main side. So the checker, where the checkerboard place should be. Yeah, exactly. It's where premium used to be. Right. Years ago. Checkerboard premium. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I remember it there. I remember it too. <laughs> Holy cow. We should be in the nursing home. It probably is one. Don't stay too loud. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so then on the second side there. Right. So what, what are the consequences if we don't vote on this? Then we're going to have to charge them 50 bucks in taxes every year. Okay. And if we don't do that, we just continue our current practice of not charging? Well, our district yeah. advisor uh -huh. knows about it yeah. because we asked her about it. Yeah. So she's going to be honest. Okay. She going to get that 50 bucks. Yeah. Well, she, yeah, she doesn't care if you make them tax exempt, but. Yeah. She just wants to. She just wants to. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. fine. I don't know. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. But okay. So, um, nobody asked us for our opinion about the budget, but we decided your guys are building the budget, so we probably ought to speak up. So, <laughs> we've been looking at our file cabinets over here and realizing that three of them are fireproof, and that's where we keep all of the land records that we really have to protect. Protect. And the fourth one is not fireproof, and in anticipation of all the paper we're going to. Produce as part of this reappraisal. We thought maybe that fourth one should be fireproof because we can barely shove the folders into the ones we got now. So that's a possibility for like a 2024 or, you know, budget thing, maybe. I, I have a question about that. I mean, we spent a lot of money and are continuing to spend money to digitize the records that are in the safe, is what I understand. Uh, the property. Yeah, I was actually going to ask if these were such important records. It's my understanding that important like land records need to be kept in the vault. Right. You so that you can't suggest that any Rosie well fit. I don't know. <laughs> try to squeeze that. I, I, I think Rosie. I think we need to have a discussion of whether these records are land records that are deemed. If they're that well, important, they're, they're not like the deeds and you know the permits, but they are. Now, this the records that we've always, you know, protected. Yeah. So we figured we're supposed to protect them. If if they disappear in a fire or for some other reason, are they on numbers? No, not no. not the well, ancient history, not Rosie's old handwritten cards and stuff. Yeah. I mean, the value, that matter? the value got picked up and put in, but the camera system where we do the costing, that happened in 2009. I was part of that because I helped the listeners do that reappraisal, and we all learned how to use camera that year. So that's how far back camera goes. And the Nemeric has, well, how far did that Nemeric go? 2000? So that, that Nemeric information right. should, should all be backed up by now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But how, how important yeah, is, yeah. is a history of appraisals? Yeah, I mean, we, I get, we had questions and they ask, you know, what the what was our taxes or what was the assessment back in? Well, what did I pay for? You know, uh, right. In 1985. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, they want to know what they paid. We found it. Uh huh. <laughs> 
But is, is that important if, to, to be able to find that? I mean, I, it's great that you have it. You can answer that. But how much do we want to spend to be able to preserve that ability? Sure. Yeah, well, the can... rear rated cabinets are not really, they're not, they're only fireproof for a limited amount of time. So if something is that, Two hours. I would argue that the vault is likely where it should be housed. Well, there's probably not space in the sprinkler. Or we should go through that to determine what pieces and parts in those files should be shifted into the vault. If anything. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, this is something I'd like to talk to Rosie about yeah. as a keeper of the land records. To, yeah. like, there's no room in there. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like, yeah. Well, I know that, but I mean, but I don't know. It's, I don't think yeah. a level of kind of landlord is a kind of perfect response for her bill. It's just that we wouldn't want to lose all these things, that's for sure. They like the how how challenging would it be to digitize those records? I think that would cost more than a file cabinet. Not one of right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. I mean, that the question is asked in the context of uh, uh, realizing, as you said, Gina, that fireproof. File cabinets only protect for so long. Yeah, yeah but the fire department is like a tenth of a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. Okay. That sounds good. I mean, you know. Yeah. We can. I, we'll make we'll do take without. It under we'll make do without it if we don't get one. Obviously, so. Right. Uh, but maybe you'll get one. Just an idea. Hey, stand us around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the second thing was, uh, well, when we were doing the Twin Valley. You remember, Seth, when we were doing the Twin Valley yeah. appeal, they filed their grievance. We have like two weeks to make a decision. Yeah. And with the select board meeting spaced out the way they yeah. are, when we asked to, we could have a conversation with the lawyer, we couldn't get permission from the select board at a meeting before we had to actually make a determination. So we thought, you know, if that could be just like a couple hundred bucks that are, you know, we've got like an allowance or something, we have to call the lawyer because we've got a question right now and we can't wait for two weeks for the select board meeting. Is there, you know, some way? I think, you can we, say, I think we decided we should run to the town administrator. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, we could actually spend some money on her say so, as opposed to having to come to us. Well, any professional services money, and that professional services can be any professional services relating to well, the legal costs. Mm -hmm. We just need to know. Just ask this them is, this is only... a different judgment because when we tried to do it before, it said no, no, we can't just fire the. The attorney, we well, you have to run it through somebody. You have to talk with the with yeah. Gina. We have to talk to Gina. Okay. Well, I don't think we've actually in the past gone to the select board for those type of activities. It kind of went through the town. Yeah, yeah. 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 we just need a separate process yeah. that works. And the, and they go. It works yeah. better with the town administrator. They're here all the time. Yeah. Select board has meetings every two weeks. Right. Blah blah blah. So it's it's the only reason it's coming up is because. The partial statutory status of the Twin Valleys tax exemption was unusual. We don't have any other like that. Yeah. And we wanted to just make sure we were on the right track. Yeah. And this this one now is a condo, which we don't have any condos in town. We have one other co-housing. Yeah. But they're starting to file deeds. And we want to make sure that all these moving parts get yeah. settled in the right place. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So no, we, we might... understand your concern. It's just okay. we want to set up a process that is going to work yeah. in the future. Yeah. So going to the town administrator is probably the best way to do it. Okay. That's good. So just, just to be clear, the request from the listeners was to have a budget line item for professional right. services. And we want to say now we have a budget item for professional services for the town as a whole. Let's get clearance from the town manager as you said. Well we have we have a we have a budget line for professional right. services. Right. And they're just yeah. asking yeah. how to access it. Is how do you yeah. access it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Access. Exactly. So. exactly. So we just didn't really clarify the process before, but I think that we have now. Okay. So um we have a line for GIS tax mapping services, and it's been a forty five hundred dollar budget. And we noticed that in the proposed budget you guys are looking at now, you've raised it a little bit. It seems fine. It seems like we're staying within around that range. So they okay. don't we're waiting for another invoice to come in. So I don't can't say for sure, but they seem to be under budget again this year too. So that's good. Um, and then we were looking at our salary. We had some strange, unusual things happen this year, like new staff needing a lot of training and then senior staff being out for 10 weeks. And so new staff having to sort of scramble and take twice as long to do things because everything was the first time. Mm -hmm. So the first six months of this year, we worked 
um, I think it was like 30 hours a week. Didn't you figure that out? 30 hours a week? It is, yeah, I told you that earlier today. Right. Yeah, the average had been 30 hours a week, but right. it was 23. But we had originally, before you know, Ross went out, we had originally figured we would each work like three days a week, and we would always have one day where the three of us are here, and a couple of days when there's two of us here, because the whole purpose of having three listeners is when you're making a change of appraisal on somebody, you want to have a second opinion, and you got to have at least two people agree. So it's a good working practice anyway. And there's enough work to do. But that would be with between 15 and 18 hours a week going forward. And in January and February, it's mostly site visit. And I mean, after February, at the end of February, we start. Uh, but I mean, it's. So oh, in January, it's 10 weeks. Yeah, good. Okay. Because in January, we're going to be working on the town report. Speaking of the town report, um, now I'm putting my auditor hand on for a second. Okay. Because I asked Larry Brown printing for um, what they estimated the costs of our book would be this year. And it's gone up enough that we've always been under budget, but I think we're in danger of being over budget unless you raise it enough for 2024. But I wanted to have a telephone conversation with them and understand it because it seems like it went up like 12%. Which seems a little high, but I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. Or maybe they kept it artificially low coming into this year. I don't know. Yeah, but twelve percent in line with inflation. Yeah, I know. So, so that means that their quote this year was like fifty six hundred and eighty seven dollars plus postage. Last year it was five thousand forty five for the same thing. Wait, let me think. Fifty six. Yep. Nope. I'm comparing fifty six to apples and oranges here. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah, so six hundred dollars more. And what's the um, budgeted amount for it? Sorry, I forgot to write it down. You got your budget in front of you somewhere? Oops, I got it. Town report printing and mailing was 5,800. And your level funding at 5,800 in 2024. He's saying it's going to be 5,600 this year, up from 5,000 last year. So I just don't know. We might be under the oh, plus postage. Excuse me. Yeah. So that's the his cost. Postage is another 250 yeah. bucks at least. And I don't know if postage went up, but it was like 250 last year. Yeah, postage went up too. So if you add 250 to that, I mean, you know, you're up to 5,900. You're over budget, right? Yeah. And that's. Budget? 5,800? Oh, yeah, but you might want to just throw yeah. another couple hundred bucks in there for, for assumption. Next. Yeah. Because we're talking about 2024. This is the 2022. We've got yeah. 2023 is going to yeah. go up and then 2024. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know how much you want to raise it, but just keep that in mind. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. that's the resort. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions? Or Deb? Oh, she's right here. Yeah, all set. Okay. Yeah, me too. Carl? No. That, Judith, yeah. Amy, got questions of Deb? Okay. Thank you, Deb. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think we've ever had Thank a you. like that, but I can remember. Well, we kind of Maybe started, I missed that meeting. You know, this is the last chance to do errors and emissions, so we thought we'd better get on the agenda just in case. But we didn't yeah, have didn't have it. Great. Appreciate you putting that together. Okay. Um, so we're going to move on because we're running a little bit late. We've got people waiting. Um, so the next thing on our agenda is the East Mafia Fire Department meeting recap, which I couldn't attend, but who did attend now? Who did the night? Oh, that was it? Yep. Wow. Well, I'm sorry that I wasn't there. I wish I had been, but so what was the big news? I would say that. Um, I'll let you know. Oh, okay. Um, just uh, just a couple of things, but the, I'll I'll leave the bigger news for the end. Um, when we began the meeting, um, the Calis Select Board reminded the East Montpelier Fire Department of an ask from our last meeting, looking for um, trend data over the past three or five up to ten years for calls. You know what the nature of the calls were, and so that we can. We and also EMFD can see if there are any trends. For example, are there more, you know, calls for falls or falls down the stairs? Is it more, you know, oriented towards older folk? 
that was a general request. The second yeah. item that came up as we were, we basically went over the budget and one item that the Calis Select Board asked about or was curious about was building one, um, which um, they represented um, the East Montpelier Fire Department has to heat, but um, East Montpelier uses part of the building. Is it fair for East Montpelier, excuse me, for Callis to pay for the heat if East, Mont or East Montpelier is getting a benefit? Blah, blah, blah. Um, ah, so <laughs> we have uh, truck the greater. Uh, blah, yeah, blah. that was that was a question that was raised. I, I did not. I didn't know if it was our building. We allowed East Montpelier Fire Department to use it. Um, I, I didn't have that history, but I. I wanted to bring it to the board to, we yeah. might want to. So the answer is yes, um, or you oh, just saying. Town owns the building. Yeah, that's what I thought. Are, and we're also using part of it. Yeah, I, I thought it was a town owned building, but I didn't want to make that representation until I was certain. Yeah. So I think, you know, we're, yeah. okay. That, that will help answer that question. Um, the big so, thing I, is- Does that help answer the question about the heating costs? Yeah, well, their question was, is it fair that East Montpelier, excuse me, that Callis has to pay heating costs for a building that's housing a town vehicle? Right. And how, how did you think that that question should be answered? Well, if we own the building, um, we're, we're contributing more we're we're more than contributing our share for the cost of storing our own um um yeah. vehicle and if the <clears throat> so anyway and is, and is heat needed for the town equipment that's kept there not particularly i mean the fire if they want to separate it they can the fire trucks need heat because they have big tanks of water yeah i don't know what yeah. the tank was kept at there i assume it's just about yeah. freezing yeah, I don't know what it is, but there is some heat. It's not, you know. There's a heating bill there. Yeah. Okay. Just Cal I want to. Fire department. Well, the emergency yeah. services does pay the heating bill. Yep. And 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 we each, you know, pay our town share towards that. So, okay. um, the the big deal was the budget regarding um staffing. Excuse me. Um, funding or salaries, which I wouldn't call salaries, they're actually stipends for the, um, the what is it called, total salaries, which are actually um, the salaries that are paid. No, of, of the employees, that, well, they don't have any um, employees that receive benefits. Everyone that works there and receives any funds receives a, a per diem. And they can't afford to pay benefits. Um, they had two folk who were. Um, it's difficult for them to meet the staffing of two people at the firehouse 24 7. So they're proposing a budget, a, a budget um, that reflects the change from the information they provided to us. And that would be an increase in the salaries. They're proposing a total of seven and a half percent increase. And what they're proposing is that um, for the remainder of fiscal year 23, the East Montpelier Fire Department will absorb that increase. But then for the fiscal year 24 budget, they're looking for um, Callis and East Montpelier to pay their proportionate share of the increase. So I think I think it was about fourteen thousand dollars, Gina, if yeah. that's correct. Okay. I think they rounded it. It was like fourteen yeah. five. I think they rounded it. Yeah, about fourteen five thousand dollars. And the reason being, I mean, they pay, currently pay, there are four different levels of EM EMT type staff. The first two, which are the lower level um, licensed EMR or basic EMTB only make $15 an hour. That's their stipend, which is fairly low. You can make more than that at McDonald's. Yeah. Um, EMTA 
earns $18 an hour. And then the highest level is a paramedic and they earn currently earn $20 an hour. They've lost one person to Barry recently, to Barry City, because they just can't p- compete. They want to maintain the staff that they have and let the staff know that they're valued and they want to keep them. So um, both Callis and I, I said on behalf of East Montpelier, we would bring it to um, the select board to, to see if they would authorize. Mm-hmm. I think it makes sense. I think it's the policy of East Montpelier to make sure that um, staff are paid um, well enough to support themselves or as much as you know we can afford um, to pay them, but recognizing that um, these people are providing an important service for our community. Um, the other kind of topic on that was um, Callis was talking about golly, um, can we provide a uh, incentive or bonus that people that live in our town who volunteer with the East Montpelier Fire Department? Um, that might be something East Montpelier wants to think about, but I don't know how many people, residents of East Montpelier are on the East Montpelier Fire Department, um, but that's just something they were talking about. I don't know if they would do it or not, but they were just discussing that. Um, How much of a stipend did they get annually now? I don't know. Think. They, although they have historically. Fire department? Fire department members get an annual stipend. Yeah, oh, um, pretty much. Um, they get $18 per call. Um, and if they attend 50% of the meetings and trainings. Um, and I, I don't know what that number is, but it's not large. <laughs> um, so some hundreds of dollars historically, I forget how much it is. Yeah, they didn't oh. I think they ever told us that. Okay. that amount. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't give us the amount, but in order to qualify for it, you need to attend 50% of the meetings and 50% of the training. Um, uh-huh. There's a volunteer stipend, but, you know, and again, they you can get $18 per call, right. um, mm-hmm. but, you know, a call could last for hours. Yeah. So. So Gina, if I forgot something or got something wrong, no, let, you got let it. us know. I think the only thing that I emailed the select board about, and this was after the meeting and not mentioned during the meeting, was that Chief Larry Brett yeah. resigned right. in December yeah. 12th. That's the only yeah. update. Right. Yep. And Albert Petrella is the uh, yep. spoke with Albert last week. Right. Oh, so he, okay. Got it. So this isn't something that we should be worried about, Larry resigning. We've got it under control. (laughs) Okay, good. Good to know. (laughs) The whole thing is escalating out of control compared to what it was envisioned when they first came to the planning commission and select board about having this ambulance service in town. It was presented much differently than what it's evolved into. It's evolved into a very, very expensive uh, organization for the town to support. And when it was first, first brought to us originally, it was going to cost us nothing. Uh, but it's evolved into a lot different. So I mean, so did 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 Larry resign as a result of the cost? No. Oh, okay. No, Thank uh, you. The, the, the department is pretty small, and um, I think there was some. What I hear, like fourth or fifth hand, there's just people just weren't weren't happy, and okay, he, and he just decided to 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 resign and step away. Retire. I don't know if you can make everybody happy. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know it, it, it's a small group, and uh, and I and I guess there were just some policies and th- decisions that were made that upset some people, and I think probably Larry just got sick of it. So, yeah. so what does worry us is this is a service that we pay for in town, and but it it's largely out of our control as far as the fire chief goes aspects of the staff and it's spiraling out of control now there's people going in as a fire chief we don't know if if they're well that's going to work um and so we may want to take a hard look at um this business model sometime in the future and maybe take it more under the town's town jurisdiction but that's a whole huge change that we may have to do because it seems like there's a lot of dissension over there and it does concern us because it's a service that we pay for and it costs us a lot. So 
Yeah, and just by way of history, the East Montpelier Fire Department was incorporated in 1964. And, uh, and when I came to town around the turn of the century, there was tension between the fire department and the select board over uh, how to provide services, how much uh, town oversight of the select board, of the fire department services there should be, and that, that has continued. Uh, I, I don't know what the story was between 1964 and the turn of the century, but it, it's it's been a conversation, and we've had conversations about looking at alternative ambulance services to bring in to uh, be stationed at that facility. Yeah, there's been a, there's been a lot of options looked at, but basically it's getting more expensive. But I think that town residents as a whole like to have the um, town town ambulance service kind of here. They like that. Yeah. They like having a service. Yeah. So we have gone along with the increased costs, which are way more than ever were envisioned when it was first started. Uh, but you know, residents seem happy, but I still think that we have to take a look at it. Yeah, and we're ha they're having a hard time finding people to oh, yeah. man to to, yeah. to service and and operate the equipment. Yeah, and yeah. make calls. Yeah, yeah, but that's on the fire side of it. On right. the ambulance side of it, they envision it would be volunteer when they yeah. first came in here. Yeah, now it's you know four hundred thousand so dollars required, required. And oh, so I know. Hours required. People I have know to be paid a lot of factors that have come into play yeah. that have made things change. Understand. But yeah. the other, on the other hand, we have a duty to look at that. Well, for sure. Yeah. Especially with what's you. going on over there. So right. anyway, we don't have the time to do it now. But no. thank you, Judith, for your um, thorough report. Yeah. I and, wish I could have attended. Yeah, and I definitely you, will try on the next one. I, I, yeah. I expected to attend, but you two were attending. Um, I just want to say about Larry Brown, that Larry Brown has um, contributed untold hours to the fire department over the years. He's been one of the most active members in the fire department for a really long time. And uh, the town owes him, the towns owe him a, a great debt of gratitude for his, his many years of service. His meetings, I thought, the ones I attended, I thought were very professionally run. Yeah. And I thought he was trying to make, you know, a lot of some inroads on make, making the, the department a little more professional. And Yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know uh, what happened. No, I, I don't think know it's all happened. internal board stuff. Yeah. Well, David yeah. Delcourt called me today about this topic. Um, I don't have any information other than... Yeah. that he resigned mm -hmm. so i don't know if he will get some information to i don't think so he asked he not to be time Argus in case he does but he I asked not to be contacted to so, right. well. mm -hmm. so we can so we can only uh, hopefully we can respect what he had to say right. yeah. Yeah. yeah well first feel free to pass on what i just said to dave if he, he calls you again yeah okay um so i think we should move on just because we have other people waiting and it's not getting any earlier um Let's see, review Central Mont Solid Waste Management Annual Summary Financial Report, FY 2024 per capita assessment. Doesn't, didn't it's change. It's consistent with prior year at $1. Okay, more. good. Do you have anything else to say? Um, the executive director, our, our general manager resigned. Hmm. What? She's going to be leaving January what? 6th. Oh, and she's the one that replaced um, Catherine Gent, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Kathleen. Yeah, Kathleen. Right. She's been yeah. in the job for how long? Well, a couple of years. Oh, she was that long. Well, time flies when you're when you're having in a COVID. pandemic. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, the uh, just one thing I want to note in here it, it shows that that they're going to be over budget, you know, or under underfunded by one hundred fifty seven thousand dollars. But that's the way it's been showing the last several years. But they never are able to staff fully. So when they have good oh, benefits, they have good pay. Yeah. And if they have a few positions that are open, they end up with a surplus. But the yeah. surplus is only on paper because huh. if they ever get staffed up, they won't have a surplus anymore. They'll probably have a deficit. Right. Um, yeah, but the deficit's on paper. Kind it's, of. It's there. It's there. And it's as if they are fully staffed. Right. Exactly. Right. right. But they're not fully staffed, so they don't really have a deficit. Right. But they will have a deficit if they get fully staffed. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> So they're moving ahead with their with their household hazardous waste facility. We're trying to negotiate uh, some prices on property. Oh, good. And they want to move ahead with that. Um, the uh, you know all that stuff is is an executive session stuff. But uh, but the, but the point is that they're they're they have a person that's going to be just filling in as as general manager, who's the assistant general manager, and we're going out for a a search for a new general manager. So if anybody's interested. You want to be general manager at the Central Vermont Solid Waste District? I would recommend uh, just getting your application in. Okay. 
Send out your resume. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I want to throw out there some information about the solid waste management district and our new representative to the house, Ella Chapin. I had a meeting with her a week ago or so to talk about primarily to talk about um, issues from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns that wanted her to be familiar with. Uh, but I also brought up the issue that we've talked about a number of times, uh, the solid waste management district and the fact that it's easy for towns to leave the district or threaten to leave the district if there's something uh, that the district's planning to do that they don't want to be part of and pay for. And that resonated strongly with her. I'd forgotten this, but she used to work at Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. She has personal experience in, in witnessing this, and she, she definitely knows that that's an issue. So if we want to be part of a discussion with the legislature about that, we've got somebody who will listen with experienced and receptive ears. I think it's a little ridiculous with the state funds this organization now. Anyway, um, if you go to some other states, um, different counties have their own, like North Carolina, the, the county that my kids live in, that, that county taxes people to get rid of their waste. So you don't pay directly out, of, uh, you know, you pay it out of your pocket, but you don't pay it every time you go. Right. And it funds the whole recycling program, right. it funds everything. You take everything that you, you know, you have and you take it to the place and, and you can, you can, you know, dispose of it there. Yeah. And I think in Vermont, I think they, they wanted people to be paying out of their pocket because they want them to feel the pain of the waste that they're right. generating yeah. right. than just having some money come out right. of your, your tax. But the thing is, down there, they even have enough money, not surplus, but enough money available so that they can hire county employees to go out and actually keep the roadsides clean. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see them out there every day doing work there. I think it's a great um, model to follow except that here we have embedded, you know, trash haulers who don't want to give up that service, but there, there still are trash haulers because there's still people who don't want to drive their truck or their car yeah. to the dump. So right. the person still goes around and picks it up. Yeah, for the same as what you so, mentioned. So, but I'm just saying that there needs to be a different funding mechanism and the towns, yeah, the towns are going out. You know what? The, the, the reason this whole per capita is down is at a dollar. Um, it's ridiculous, really. How much do they get out of, out of East? Montpelier, but $2,500. You know, if East Montpelier left today, they would lose $2,500. What else are they going to lose? Yeah. <laughs> right. So the point is, every, and, and I know by being on the board, that if we mentioned raising the per capita, there's some towns that go, get out of yeah. here. I know. Get out of here if they raise that 50 cents. I know. Can you stand I think it? it's so, I think it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I, th I agree. I have to go. Yeah. Not because, it, because I just think they don't, they're not living in the same world the rest of us are living in. And um, and I think that we need to do a better job of handling solid waste. And I think that that doing it, having state funding change, alter that state funding to certain, so they have enough money to do what they need to do. We would have a hazardous waste facility, That's and instead right. of people throwing that into their trash and a canister throwing it in yeah. the trash and yeah, putting yeah. it in the bag and sending it to Coventry, it would be how, dealt with in the right way. In the right way. Yeah. And it's not going to be dealt appropriately until we do something different. But anyway, that's my band. That's my soul bar. That's pretty interesting. Though. It is. That's what I've learned out of being yeah. there. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. you're there at the table for us. Well, it's not good for my blood pressure. But <laughs> oh, so you're all done? Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Are you, you done? have to take, put all that down. Are you all done talking? Huh? Are you all done talking? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I just want to follow the here. I know because you gave a lot of weight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just that John said something. About <laughs> You're not going to go into the minutes and vet those like that? No, I'm not. No. But you, you got to have John in. No. I, no. Yeah, I say Seth, but that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you for that report. Can we move on to the um, quickly, please? Discussion with Planning Commission Chair. We're halfway through page two of five of our uh, extended memo. So, yeah. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll try to gain you some time back. <laughs> um, Very nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if stuff will go, go on the Planning Commission, we did, you know, the Regional Planning Commission did approve the town plan amendments. So, if we do have someone try to come with a, another cell tower, we're, you know, we're solid on, you know, what the what the rules are, what the plan yeah. is. Yeah, that's good. all good to go. Um, we are currently working on the energy plan. Um, the energy, you know, the big, you know, the big issue there is that I think you, you know, the energy committee sort of went dormant about I don't know 
five, six years ago. I'm not sure exactly Back when. Back when Dave Gundy passed away. No, yeah, that, yeah. No, no, this was the phase of the energy. Oh. They so I, I, I yeah. yeah, so um, yeah, Lindy Biggs and Court Richardson had been chairing it. Um, oh, Court yeah. is Court, you know, Court is no longer active. He's um, you know, for for health reasons. And I talked to Lindy about it. And she, you know, we're she was of the opinion that it probably makes sense to disband and essentially reform the Energy Committee. Um, we have been doing some recruiting. We have a you know you know you know core group that is that that seems seems interested. Seems like there may be some leadership there. Um, so we can certainly you know, do you know, bring you know, bring some names in for people that I think would make yeah you know, would make sense. Um, obviously it, it's your appointment to make, but we sort of we sort of figured that because we are the ones actually working yeah. on it, we should we should do do some legwork rather than just come to you and say, hey, get go get us an energy committee. <laughs> so we yeah, so we can come in with yeah you know, and and help out with that. Um, so you got some names. We've we've got some names. We've got something coming in going into the next signpost. So we're going to try to do a little bit more broad based recruiting as well. Yeah. But yeah, at this point, I've got at least five people who are interested. Oh, nice. Uh, someone who was part of that earlier iteration that we did a lot of work. Yeah. We left to Lindy Biggs to put together in in um, a town plan amendment. And uh, how much of that do do we have now? So we so we had we have the old work that was done. I'm Tom Fisher, who was in the, on the original. Your group is interested in continuing on. Okay. Okay. So there is there is some additional knowledge there. Um, it's also the way these the plans are written ha really has changed. Um, okay. the, the place where a lot of the old energy committee's work is actually going to live on is there's a lot of stuff that got put into the town plan really be yeah you know, from the energy committee. So like a lot of the transportation stuff really came from the yeah. energy committee. There's yeah. stuff about you know, the, you know heat in housing that come comes from the the energy committee and so that those i think rather than have this entire separate plan we're really going to revamp the you know the cell the cell tower sector was actually largely based on the energy the, the energy section that came out of that mm -hmm. and i think it's sort of then going to go go back again are required for name energy plan do that as a town plan amendment so it'll be all integrated okay. um, ba basically what they want to do in order to have with a big carrot for the town is having an enhanced energy plan allows you to um you know to have a real say in the siting of lar of large energy projects um but there's basically a a provision that doesn't you know basically to prevent a town from saying well we're going to come up with this criteria and that criteria and that criteria and all of a sudden oh, you can't put a solar farm anywhere to say you have to identify mm -hmm. enough land to meet your energy needs you know, if if we if you're going to be allowed to say no, you can't do that. So for us to say, okay, we have certain areas we want to protect. You know, why haven't you gone and looked at the at the cap land bill? Yeah, just so yeah. So correct correct me if something changed or if I'm misremembering something, Zach. But the idea is right now, if somebody comes in and proposes a large energy project in East Montpelier, we can't point to the town plan and say. There's something in here that uh, whether it's you know, scenery or or whatever, we can't say, hey, there's something in our town plan that means public utility commission. You should not give these guys a certificate of public good. Um, the, the PUC doesn't really have to pay any attention to anything in our town plan. Whereas if we do uh, put that section in, then they have to give us, I forget what the term of art is, deference or substantial deference. They have to pay attention yeah. to the town plan in their planning process, in their approval process. Yeah, and and the one the one case where we did oppose a large solar de development loss, it actually wasn't about scenery. It was about the, it was about the fact that it was a piece of land right outside the town center that had approved septic system yeah. designs on yeah, it that right. we, yeah, you know, and it was you know, and, and that we want we wanted that as develop for development because it was one of the few places in the in the center but still, that do wastewater. Still got approved. Yeah, be, be, partly because we didn't have an a, you know an approved plan. Yeah. Um, so I said, the other thing that we are looking at, just sort of looking at now, especially with, it, with having the energy plan starting starting to move more, having an energy committee starting, we're looking at what else we should be working on. Um, certainly, we're looking at you know whether you know there was a there's an item in the current town plan about doing a housing assessment. I think because you know the, the need for housing has become so, so much hotter than it was when we were doing the plan. You know, did, did the last plan just start? Yeah, I think we want to start looking at that. Um, and there's some business talk to we look at you know what needs to be done to support more senior housing, more you know, yeah, more more affordable housing. Um, 
one thing we were thinking, I didn't know if this was something that you would that you would say, oh, we've talked about this, you know, 14 times and it's it's dead. Um, you know, is do we do we want to do something looking at the septic capacity, of, particularly at the village center, about and and would it be helpful to 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 have something that says, you know, here's you know, here's what we're zoned for to be able to build out to realistically based on wastewater, here's what we can actually do in case. For example, in case there was grant money or state money available at some point, and you need to be able to say, "Here's what we can do. Here's what that could really mean for us." Well, we have done that. I don't know, the 14 times, but we've done that uh, more times than I thought was necessary. I was part of one of the committees uh, mm -hmm. that, that looked at that, and uh, at that time, we just found prohibitive costs. I think there were like three studies that were done. We found prohibitive uh, costs mm -hmm. for either decentralized wastewater treatment here in uh, the village that would then you'd have the idea that you'd have septic tanks at the houses, uh, but then you'd have, because there were septic tanks first, you'd have very small pipes. Yeah. And you could then go to a nearby field and use the field as a, a septic field. But you know that cost pretty close to the cost of bringing out the sewer from Montpelier. And Montpelier would love to have more users on their water and wastewater plant because uh, they it's overbuilt for their use, but uh, it costs a lot to extend the pipeline from there. And it was like six of one, half a dozen of the other, and both were very costly. Now, at that time, we were thinking, okay, the era of the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. when the federal government was giving a lot of money to municipalities to put in water and wastewater, that's over. We aren't getting any money from the federal government. Mm -hmm. But now we just missed the vote on some ARPA funding or some, some infrastructure funding. I don't know if there was some funding handing out to municipalities announced uh, in the last month or so. Um, that, that we just missed the boat on. So maybe we should be in touch with our contact at um, regional planning or our contact at BLCT about federal funding to see if there are opportunities for, for using some of that and dust off some of those old studies and uh, see what information we might want to get to, to update them. Okay, I don't, I don't want to take too, you know, too much of your time. Carl, does it make, can that make sense for me to touch base with you you're outside of the meeting just Absolutely. to try to get to some of that history? Yeah, and, and and we've, got, see if I can... we've got files on that. Yeah. And, and it was millions, millions of dollars. Yeah. yeah. I, I knew the cost was prohibitive. I, I didn't know if there was you know, if there was something that could, you know, Thinking about like how, how to make the, the case or, or or how to push your know, private. I I hadn't realized there had been that much work done on oh, distributed exactly. systems and yeah. and sort of like how to push private developers into doing this. All yeah, I'll talk a lot by a lot of analysis. Okay, what's maximum build out we could expect given yeah. the zoning here? Future yeah. developments in zoning, how much wastewater would that generate? Where would you yeah. build the system? And so mm -hmm. on. Pretty detailed. Okay, I'll yeah. I'll touch base with that. The the last thing that we've been thinking that I sort of wanted to get get your temperature on was you know we're so we're looking at the next town plan will be due um, in I think May. In May or June of 2026. So we're we're a few years out, but sort of you know. We're thinking about if there's no one, I don't believe there's anyone in the town, any group in the town that really sort of looks at the town plan and says, okay, so we put all these action items in the things we want to do. How did we actually do on them? You know, there are, I think, 126 action items in the town plan. The, the planning commission itself has a role in about 40 of them. And so I don't, I don't know if it would be appropriate for us to sort of take on, on a role to sort of start to go to the other groups and say, okay, so here's a here's a thing that was in the town plan. You know, have we had movement on it? Is it something that we want to take on in the next you know, couple of years before the next planning cycle? Or or were we you know, a little too ambitious with you know, sort of all these things that we put in? But generally the, the planning commission will vet those um, action items mm -hmm. and say, oh. This didn't happen. Yeah, but you're saying you would go directly to some of the people that would be more responsible for those action items and have them directly, rather than just saying, "Oh, it didn't happen." But you're going to go to the committee and say, "Why didn't it happen?" I don't. So I hadn't really thought about exactly what it was going to mean. And honestly, I think there are certain things that we don't necessarily know. You know, you know all yeah. the, all the things that are happening. Right. Right. Um, and so I think, but I, I think it would partly be a check and to say, okay, so we had this, you know. In the plan, you know, does it you know, does it make sense to keep yeah. to keep it on the list? Yeah. You know, or you know, or are there things we should know about? You know, why it? You know, what, you know. I mean, some of those things probably ought to come to attention. It's like, 
Well, remember that process that Bruce set up and did for a while with us, uh, uh, where he identified the action items from the then current town plan that the select board had responsibility for implementing. Mm -hmm. And then we just spent some meetings going through them and deciding, yeah. okay, yeah. Uh, what have we done here? Have we done enough? Uh, right. What are we going to do? Maybe, maybe when we reconstitute uh, after town meeting with the, the new select board, mm -hmm. we should have a priority setting session where we look at the town plan amongst other things and say, hey, what are we going to do in the next year? Well, they can identify some of the items that they feel that they have some responsibility to and some of the items that we would have more jurisdiction over or more input mm -hmm. and bring those to us. Yeah. So we don't have to look through the 120. Yeah, and and I think to do, do a little bit of prioritization of like who's really the primary, you know, for like yeah. for because we don't have the authority to like right. to, to have final sign off. Like I think like almost everything the planning commission is the is the you know is listed the select board is also listed on. You know, yeah, you're not you know you're, yeah. you're you're not going to be the ones you're know, dealing with you know the twenty zoning items on right. there. Right, yeah. but yeah. but we are responsible in for some. Yeah, yeah. And those are the ones that we should probably. Be brought to our attention mm -hmm. so we know what to do. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. So you could separate it a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Sounds right. good. Yeah, sounds good. What else do you want to blab yeah. about? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I point <laughs> day. No, I, I I understand. That's that's what I have for you. No, that's good. Um, yeah, it's all good information actually. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions for that? Thank you very much. Well, thanks for coming in. Well, thank you for coming in, and um, you know, be in, be in touch. Now, oh, I have one little question on your energy committee. How many people are you looking to have on that? I think we're looking for somewhere in the range of five to seven. Yeah, yeah, good. And you've got some names, which is exciting, and then maybe I'll have a few more. Yeah, and then uh, you can't. That'll be good. And we can see what they are. And will you be? You'll vet them first. We we, gonna... we certainly can. Um, yeah, we, yeah. we hadn't we I mean and initially we initially were thinking like can we get you know, can we actually get yeah you know, anyone and and do we have at least one person who is interested in a leadership role? You know, yeah, we didn't, we didn't want to be in a position right. where we had a whole bunch of people who were interested in being yeah. a member of the right. of the energy committee, but but nobody who was interested in sharing it. Yeah. So do you have somebody? I think so. Oh, okay. Well, I guess what we're looking for your recommendation, basically. And yeah. If you feed that, then that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we can certainly do that. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Uh, thank you, Jack. You're welcome. So our next item is discussion on FY 2024 budget development. And what do we have? So just provided you a bit of a, I mean, I think, I think everyone in the room and on the video kind of understand where the costs, what the driver is behind costs, primarily it's staffing, um, and benefit costs, um, some adjustments for obviously higher costs today, and then adjustments for the latest budget from the fire department for both fire and ambulance. Um, I have reviewed the budget with uh, Guthrie, also. Um, for their sections and then accordingly. Um, one thing that kind of came up today, um, and the thing was Deb mentioned something about their their hours. She asked me how the listers were trending against their budget, and I said, "Well, you're certainly here more than um, for what the budget was outlined for." Um, did pull some history. That, and that's where she got the 30 hours per week that they were they're working on average 30 hours per week it was budgeted at 23. Um, she, she, I was also asked about what their rate increase would be uh, because typically it's been 50 cents a year for their hourly rate and I just kind of carried and followed suit with that of course that's all of that is just a forecast and an estimate on any increases those will all be decisions made by the select board when the time comes um and the question was specifically raised about, you know, the social security adjustment of eight, whatever percent. And, yeah. and I said, well, that's not what I'm currently, I'm assuming an overall 4% on average. 
um, for the staff. I did only include the 50 cents for them. Um, but again, that can change. So, yeah. you know, in looking at the history for the listers, the budget's been 23,000 per year since fiscal year 21. Their actual has been 17,000 in 2020, 14,000 in 21, and 19,000 in fiscal 22. So there's some flexibility there yeah. within that $23,000 budget based on the hours that have historically been worked yeah. to where that the hourly rate could go up and still keep the budget somewhat constant. I was led from the discussion of the day to believe that maybe the budget needed to be increased, but after their conversation and report to you now, that doesn't seem like the direction that they're going in. Um, so I, I just was bringing this to you guys because I the conversation kind of threw me for a little bit of a loop today because I don't have any oversight management. You know, I see their timesheets. I sign off on them, but I have no... <laughs> No, they're elected officials. Yeah, they're elected officials. So I didn't know what this process was in both teams and managing the budget for the elected officials. I think that I think the select board has the has the total control over those allocations. Well, the select board has the control of the budget. That's what I'm saying. So that's how you can control the cost. It's a backward way of doing it. Right. It's like, oh, you're it's, going it's, on the budget, better not it's, do that. It's, the, it, it's one of the few ways that, that, that the, one of the few mechanisms that the select board has for elected officials. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. not the only one. The right. And there was an analogous conversation uh, in the year or so before, year or two before I joined the select board, where the list the case for increasing the current year budget for them because directors needed to talk with each other a whole lot to come to an agreement about new things, which is kind of analogous to I think what, what we heard uh, today. Uh, and the select board, uh, as far as I could tell, declined to act on the request. Okay. Right. And so I Same. wrote all that you see in this memo prior to receiving anything from yeah. the listers, so it didn't come in until the meeting had actually started. So I, I think they got their heads around it a little differently from what I was led to believe today. Yeah. I thought that they were seeking a higher budget and well, it looks like they were going over for this year, but that wasn't then the message that came to the meeting. The so. message I got was Deb had to learn mm -hmm. and Ross was out because yep. he had a stroke. So she worked a lot of hours, didn't really know what she was doing. Yep. Now she's going to work less hours. He's back. Yeah. And it seemed like that we would be smart to keep the budget where it is yeah to get we they say in their report is going forward we plan to level off our joint yeah. combined hours uh to and we expect this will put us in line with our annual budget yeah so, yeah so yeah. like i said that wasn't the so, one we were right. taking earlier yeah. today right. so it, it has shifted and evolved i think yeah. since three thirty. So maybe happened. you steered them in a productive so, direction um mm -hmm. but so it just got, I just wasn't sure where to go with this, if we needed, you know, what that process would be, if we needed to revisit this budget, but I understand there's been training, but I mean, even with Ross being back, the hours have still been pretty consistent. Um, they haven't really tweaked down too much just yet. So um, the listers are the only elected official. Hey, is that correct? The auditors as well. The auditors. I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think I we think better I'm keep good. the budget where it is. Yeah. For sure. Is that fine? Yeah. We got to control costs. And that seems like a way to do it. Mm -hmm. And again, I think if we, if there's a discussion to be had in the future, nothing was mentioned tonight about the hourly rate. That's something when the time comes, we can certainly. I do understand that hourly rate. It's Agreed. only 2.63 percent. But you've got. But and again, but looking at the past, it seems like there's actually flexibility. If you look, I think that if the hours normalized to what we've seen historically, I, it looks like there, there's some room to adjust that hourly rate and still keep the budget where it is. Right. So. Yeah, I wonder about the reappraisal when that comes up, how many more hours the listers are going to need to put in for that. I can't remember yeah. what happened with that. Well, you'd <laughs> probably be funding them out of some of the reappraisal budget. Okay. But well, the extra hours that they were. Didn't we have a external appraiser come in but yes. oh yeah what you have yeah. to do you have to yeah when the cla gets out 10 percent. oh when was the last time the uh hourly rate was changed an extra hour
What? Did you hear me? Um, no. When was the last? Oh, sorry. When was the last time the hourly rate was changed? Am I frozen? <laughs> it's, Every it's, year. It's been 50 cents, okay. I think, a year for. It's gone okay. up 50 cents a year. So what, I'm sorry, what is the hourly rate? I should know it, but I don't. It's $18. It's 19. Oh, it's 19? Right yeah. yeah. I mean, most anybody does if, it. If the price gets high enough, it would even pay to just go to a, a licensed appraiser. Oh, we we'll get right back into that again. <laughs> just back into that. Because, um, I, I, hey. You get better you, results. Well, some people say you don't. Some people say you do. Some people say you lose the local, you, the local person looking at your house. But on the other hand, oh, you know what? You can, if you have an outside appraisal, you're, you're having somebody who's objectively looking at your property, not looking at who you are, where you live, whatever, they're looking at where the property that they're appraising. And there's other towns that have done it. It'd be great to contact Waterbury, uh, Hardwick, any of those towns that have done that and ask them why they did it. One thing I learned in a conversation with somebody who does that for a list living is that there's a hybrid model available that I wasn't aware of before, and that is. You retain your elected listers, and they participate in uh, the tax appeals. Uh, but the work of maintaining the grand list right. is done by the professional. I think at Hardwick they kept one lister, okay, um, to work as an interface and to actually be the kind of front person going up doing the appraisals and stuff. But did not utilize any any of the other positions. They couldn't fill them anyway. They couldn't find anybody who wanted the job. And and then the appraiser spends one day a week, or yeah, one day a week in in Hardwick, and they pay basically the money they get from for the reappraisal services. I think cover plus the, plus their budget line item covers the cost for that appraiser yeah. to be there. Yeah. And the whole idea here is that that appraiser will keep the the grand list sufficiently supplied with data. Um, so that you don't have to have a reappraisal as regularly. Yeah, because the CLA is, is more consistent. That's right. what the argument is about. It doesn't that, drop. Is that, no, is that they're able to keep the appraisers the appraisals higher yeah. and, and adjusted more quickly so that you don't have to have a, a more con a common reappraisal. Well, because that's $100,000 a year. Right. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. a big expense. Mm -hmm. What's the reappraisal. Oh, yeah. It's over yeah. 100000 Right. Yes. So if you, keep your, if you keep your common level of appraisal more in line with sales, then you are not state mandated to have a reappraisal. So you're getting that's it's a, that's the whole idea. You're getting right. a payback by having a professional service provide the appraisal. So yeah. does that mean that between town wide reappraisals, then the average person might get a letter saying we're changing the valuation on your property because of what sales in, in the area? We've seen what's going on. You mean, I think what they do is they they will look they they will periodically just go in and appraise, look at the value of, of houses in particular areas, maybe areas where the prices have been going up, uh -huh. and they'll see well how do you your property relate to that property and that property and that yeah. property that's yeah. sold for this amount. Um, that's exactly it. Okay. Well, so wait a minute. This is getting off subject. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> right. Okay. But because, really actually, I know a little bit about the subject, but let's not get into it. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's so, a good question, though. But I, but no, no. Great they, they don't chase sales, though. Yeah. You can't chase sales in the town. No, it you. has to be, and, and, and it has, it's over a, a period of time, and it has yeah. to be, and uh, end of hand, you know, what do they call them? Yeah. You might, yeah, yeah. yeah. Arms length. Yeah, arms, arms length like, sales, yeah. and some of these aren't. So, they, I mean, anyway, these. It's a perfect. So yeah. That's what they do. They okay. know how to do it. Okay, let's go along with budget. I'm all tired out now. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, don't write it all that down. No. <laughs> hey, just say John talked so about it. <laughs> okay, the important thing is here that you mentioned John's name. Okay. No, <laughs> Seth's name. No, I am not doing it. Okay, let's Okay. Go. Yeah, budget film. Well, you guys tell me what, what how question? do you want to continue? Moving forward, reviewing the budget. Um, so we're still at, going through it myself, but we'll I mean, there's going always through it. a little something that I see a lot of every things. day. So what what has changed since the last time we looked at it? Is that the orange lines? Well, the orange lines are the change from the prior year. Mm -hmm. um, really, the change from the last time we looked at it was highway budget um, went through um, costs with Rosie, and then the fire department. Those are really the big changes. And then they're just little things that have been trickling in 
you know, the per capita from solid waste management, you know, as, as I get information like that when I'm updating numbers, if, uh -huh. if something comes in. Mm -hmm. So should make it easier for us to zero in on yep. hone in. Can we drop some of the orange line? Mm -hmm. Are we okay? So for instance, the health insurance. Yep. We know that's we know what that is. Yep. Let's drop that. Okay. Okay. Um Social Security Medicare. Yeah, the we need calculation. To, yeah, I mean, that's cookie cutter stuff. We don't need mm -hmm. to be going over that. Municipal retirement. Based on current staffing plan. I mean. Yep, those are all calculations based on the salary. Yeah, and those are not ones that we can change. Mm -hmm. they got to be in the budget, but mm -hmm. we don't really have any input on that. Yeah. So the ones that we need to look at, that, that we need to have orange lines on, mm -hmm. are ones that there's going to be some discussion potential on, or need to be okay. discussed on. How's that sound? Okay. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, well, you know, like dental insurance. Eh. Yeah, all those are Town liability. They're essentially insurance. calculations. So this is what it is, right? Yeah. Vermont State Police. That's probably not going to, we can't affect their 5.9% increase. Well, I really, we should I really out. put that in that kind of would be something for discussion and we can okay. table it for the next meeting. But yeah. um, I, you know, I have had a conversation with Washington County. I think with both organizations. I We've think done that before. speak to them in March. Um, okay. Um, but uh, to potentially consider, I kind of threw that thousand yeah. just to give us a little bit extra in the events we decided to split. Well, okay. typically what happens in March is our Call is that Vermont State Police comes in and says, "Here's what we can do for you. Here's a contract. Yeah. We sign it, and, and we do." So um, I, you you've been in touch with Washington County already, correct? Well, it was only because there was an issue with the schools so that they had here specifically okay. about this. They and were short staff, they were right. Involved, right. but they, they were they were expecting to get in that conversation when they came by to speak about the situation about the school. Uh -huh. Mentioned they expected to see some improvement in their staff okay. and that they may have some capacity. And we know Vermont State Police. I mean, all law enforcement is yeah. trapped right now. Yeah. So would it be something? So yeah. it, as issues arise, could we get a little bit more? We all know Vermont State Police will yeah. run their budget with that because they just don't have the people. Yeah. Yeah, but for purposes of budget, yeah, put in five point nine percent. That's all we need to talk about. Okay. Right, right, and okay. then and then with the sheriff, what if we have them in in February, mm -hmm. so we yeah. get a little bit of an idea of what our options are. So yeah, we, when we yeah, but is this a realistic number? Five point nine percent increase depends on how many how much they can actually spend, how much time they can spend our time. Yeah, it is. So I'm a lot of these are. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> no, I mean, you're, you're yeah, estimating absolutely. what you think. Yeah. You don't know. It's a big estimate. You hope you don't use the money, too. Exactly. You know? yeah. Sometimes Sometimes we hope we don't have to. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so external audit, you've got 4.4%. Yeah, that's a complete guess. I just, you know, we we technically can go and look for a new auditor this year. I mean, I don't know what the cost will be from Sullivan okay. Powers, and we like them, but. So that's a good number. Office custodial. What's everyone think? Ops electricity, you're just going with. Yeah, I'm just electric. throwing some adjustments in there. They're going to 14. They want to do a 14. She's got 15. 9. 22 here. Yeah, well, that's fine. I mean, I'm just trying to make some suggestions to narrow our focus here yep. on orange lines that we're going to discuss. Right. Where do you typically hone in with the budget that you dig into? We don't. Okay. <laughs> well, most of what happens with with the, with the town budget is you see there's going to be annual increases, and especially now they're even worse. But for things like insurance and yeah. power, nothing. And, you know, there, a lot of these are all fixed costs. They're yeah. going to keep they keep increasing a little bit, but they are fixed because they don't go down. Yeah. And so we know that. So we just try yeah. to add in what we think will be the increase. And Washington Electric is going to go up 14, almost 15 percent this year if they get the rate increase. Yeah. And so that's going to impact a lot of insurance. No? Um, I'm just shaking my head. Yeah. yeah. Because, I, that's a lot. Yeah. And just to, to expand on, on your yeah. nothing uh, yeah. <laughs> comment, I, thought uh, I, think, I was wrong. I think basically what we've done in the past is that uh, we've looked at this, and Bruce has highlighted the as yet unknown expenses. We haven't okay. gotten the request from this, this group okay. or that group. Does that, does that okay. ring a bell with you all? Yeah. yeah. 
Well, the other things that can happen too is like, how much do you want to contribute to the uh, capital uh, fund? You know, mm -hmm. this year. That, that's always a yep. point of discussion. Yep. And if it's 15, if you want to go up a percentage rate or whatever, you figure out what that's going to do the tax rate. Yeah. You know, yeah. if it's a big, so. And that's, it's passive, because that's flexible. And in the past, if you if you'd raise your budget three percent a year, you know, with the inflation the way it was, we were fine. We didn't have to dig into it. We just looked to see if anything was out of place. Right. But the thing is, now with the changing, you know, the inflation and everything, I oh, think yeah. we're doing really good to keep some things at eleven percent. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I haven't really <clears throat> jumped things too much because it you just i mean the salary costs kind of were enough and we know what those are yeah um other things i don't just want to go and drop yeah. 15 percent across the board no. because that may not no. right so be on necessary. the yeah. so on the bond so, interest it looks like it's that's a calculation it looks like it yeah. went down because that's there's an amortization be, schedule right that's because the we are right is inherently so, so we don't need to look at yeah. that though yeah okay mm -hmm. um IT maintenance, yeah, increased due to new yeah. hires, yeah. so that's okay. Modern increase in the GIS mapping services, five point six percent. That's yeah. I don't believe we get anything specifically to tell us what that cost. But okay. Look. The software you've got up going twenty percent. Is that the software in the office? That's website. It's yeah. Yes. Yeah running various systems yeah i think gis is probably going up because their salaries are going up and uh it also relates to the amount of information they have to digitize like any any development you have subdivision you have that is is digitized by them and put in, in any new surveys are all put into the gis system so the more of that work you have them do the more it costs you it's so they, they're just guessing just like we're guessing what what the increase would be <clears throat> Then Guthrie and I went through his budget line by line and we accordingly. And he's, they've got some significant costs, I'm sure. You know, not as much, not as bad as you would think. Oh, good. Heating fuel, of course, 14.3. Garage crash. But those are things that are out of our control. Uniform costs. Yeah. Solve. I see the mulch went up. Yes, that has gone up. Hmm. And then I think we know now the voted articles are being requests. What's that? I said, I think we know now the voted articles and funding requests. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. tonight, so yep, that yep. will all get updated as well. Yep. I think you're doing no, a good job. I think you're doing well. Yeah. I think, but I think you can drop a bunch of lines. Okay. I will do that. Yeah. And and bring up stuff that you know that you have questions on. Okay. Or controversial, you know. But okay. those, in, you know, there's a lot of stuff here. It's just the way it is. You know, okay. it's like okay. And we've seen some of it anyway. We knew right. Yeah. We, we knew we, we knew a lot about it anyway. Yeah. yeah. So so what do you you want to have this again? Yeah. That maybe yeah. shows up just new. New yeah. new things that you've identified. That's what I think. And, and not the old things because we're we're aware of them already. Yes. Yeah. You could just maybe use a different color, but no, orange is fine. <laughs> oh, you're saying blue, blue and orange <laughs> or something? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> zip it up, John. Zip it John, up. you're pretty mouthy. I have uh, you have a lot to say to them. Well, that's okay because I know what I know the goal. John. So in the town meeting morning. Or, yes. Are we talking so, about that now? No, we're uh, we're just finishing up the budget. Okay. I was actually taking your words, Carl. I think yeah. when we first went over this, you said it starts out very yellow and then it gets less yellow right. as we go. Right. right. So my question tonight is, how can we start getting it less yellow? <laughs> well, for example, I'm, I just have Article Five randomly in front of me. We know the um, request yep. from yeah. Yeah, we can unyellow all. Of yeah. 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 All of these and, should be updated. And Article 1 is completely unyellowed. Um, to hear the reports of the several town officers and to act thereon is now part of this. Thank you. Yep, you are welcome. Was there anything else that you, your research turned up that we needed to add on? No, on not at all. 19. Okay, good. Um, now, the listers suggested an Article 16 for that uh, East Montpelier Gully Jumpers, East Montpelier Trail piece of property they're tax exempt and I see that there's only 14 
articles listed here. So I'm not sure where they came up with 16, but but it it seems like we agree that that's something that we should put before the voters based on their recommendation. Maybe I just misspoke because it would be Article 15. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Although, isn't there usually a final article about any other business that it may become for come before the time? Yeah, they uh, properly come before the. Uh, is that listed as an article or is that just something you do? Yeah. Okay. No, okay. It's listed as an item. Okay. An article. okay. So that would be the last one anyway. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. for me, 15. 15, yeah. Sounds like yeah. it. So the um, gully jumpers, trails that the. the Tax exemption would be 15 and then the, any other business yeah. would be 16. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe they just misread it or something. Maybe they didn't have the glasses on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will so we're pretty close. yellow on this. And if there's anything I leave yellow, then it will be a discussion yeah. point for the next meeting. Awesome. That sounds good. Awesome. So on the town forum, That looks, you would have to add that one in too. Yes. Article 15. Yeah, it will get adjusted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's talk about the times, right? It wasn't this what we were talking about before? Is if we're gonna do this at a regular meeting, we're gonna have the town forum first, correct? Six you four. guys had discussed also doing like opening both the select well, no. meeting. And we, we, so. Yeah, that's why I'm bringing it up because yeah. if you have a set time for the adjourn, then you're then you've got to start the next meeting at, at nine o'clock. Correct. Okay. I mean, you can't set the time for adjourn because if no one comes to the town forum. So you mean we can? We need to have a flex somehow. Flex. So we would to, start. We would open the. the we can open open the select. Board meeting and the town. And I wasn't going to suggest that. That was what uh, Carl suggested last time. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, if we have a set time here for the town forum to end, that means that we can't start a select board meeting before that. Right. So should, so down that high, we should have no time. Right. Yeah. Right. And probably none of these items have any times on them for the town forum. Is that, is that right? Well, is the like beginning for, is okay. You could have the we yeah, we can, have, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but nothing else okay. right after that should have a time. Just like town meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. Because yeah. we want to be able to open our select board meeting anytime we're done with this. Good, Good yeah. catch. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because that's the problem we had before. I was I mean, like, well, let's 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 do the select board meeting. No, no one we here. have to say First all, right. <laughs> so that did not work. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Looks good. Hey, okay, we're getting there. Yeah, we're getting there. Uh, discussion on 2022 Select Board Annual Report. So this oh. is your letter that goes into yep. the town report. It's our report, right? And traditionally, it's not that work, right? So wonderful. No, letter. I don't write, it. <laughs> <laughs> but I can. <laughs> but it'll be very short. Some students <laughs> want some ideas that we would be talking exactly. about. Because obviously, I was not here for yeah. essentially How about the center of that year. Sidewalks. So. Um, the sidewalk improvements, you know, we went a whole year or so now with new sidewalks. Wouldn't that be nice to just say, you know, just. Oh, we already talked about the sidewalks. Okay. Well, how about improvement to the town think... office? How about transition of town staff? I think that's a big one. Well, that's the biggest that's one. That's a big one. I just throw them out there. I throw yeah. it against the wall. If it sticks, uh, you got <laughs> Did you just notice that the sidewalks? They've been there for three years. We, I think it's nice to talk about them. <laughs> no, we we've had a we've had this big big turnover in office staff and uh, that's huge. And, and we want to uh, we want to thank first of all the people my, that were here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. we want to thank people who took the jobs and are working for us now. Of and, course. And, and to say how lucky we were in this tight job yeah. market to find highly qualified people for yeah. these positions. We did better than a lot of communities. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Calvis wants to meet with me. Yeah. Okay. They can't get. Callis wants to meet with you. Yeah. I got an email today. They want to understand my role and. Well, they they they're they, having a hard time. The representative from Callis was was talking at the Central Mount Salt Waste Management meeting about how they can't find people mm -hmm. and kind who, of this. Who would want to work for them? They've yeah. said they they have 
met, interviewed enough we can't people and get offered the position with no success. Yeah. Today. yeah. I mean, we're we're an easy town to work with. We're we're a fun group to work with, and we pay well. That's the difference. That's right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I will put some things on paper and bring that to you. Okay. So, okay. Um, seriously, though, are there any other accomplishments that we want to pat ourselves on the back about? I mean, County Road. County, County Road. Road. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was a the big project. project. Yeah. Project. Huge mm -hmm. project. And mm -hmm. it would be good to bring that up in a positive light because some yeah, people absolutely. didn't think about it very positively. Yeah. Um, there's some other things, little things like the. So one of the right one now. of the things that we might want to point out, and this is patting ourselves on the back, is that for the road improvements that we did on the county road, and also because our paving plan is much different than it used to be, we didn't have to borrow money for any of this stuff, mm -hmm. and that should be mentioned. Yeah, that's that, awesome. That yeah, yeah that really is because of our plan, plan, our capital plan. We're putting money aside, and we yeah. can do these road projects. These yeah. huge improvements. That was huge, Kudos and that was expensive. And you know what? We had the money to pay for it. Right, yeah. without having to borrow. Right, and that's, that's going to be huge. more critical as we move forward. That's the more money you have in the bank now, the more you're going to make on it, and the more you have to borrow, the more you're going to pay on it. And, so. the, and they're saying, "Don't be borrowing money now. Interest rates are high." So, right. and we had a discussion earlier today about East Montpelier Fire Department and the ambulance and possible changes in the future. And I think in a previous report or two, we have put down a marker in the select board report, just mentioning, you know. This is a dynamic situation that we're looking at, and maybe some something along those. It's lines. going to be a budget driver in the future. Yeah, continue to be, yeah. and something to keep note of. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, so that that's going to that's a touchy subject. Yes, it is. It's touchy, but you don't have to say it in a negative way. We, we do. don't. We don't want to say it negative. No, uh, I'm just saying that's that's a that's a that's a touchy subject. But if you want to look in in the last like three yeah. years, because <laughs> it's it's come up within the last three. Oh, years, we we done. put it on there yeah. a couple of years ago because we we're looking for conversation right. about you know did people want the service kept in town? Yeah. Remember, we planted people in the audience to ask the appropriate yep. questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before he was on the select board. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll have to see how yeah. that comes out yeah. in in the. Before. But it, it's just it, it's an important driver of our budget, and it's oh, a long term concern. Yeah. It's just something for us to keep before the people. Well, time. we want to make sure that we keep having a good service. Yeah. Um, okay. Think about something else besides that. So I think. Huh? How about how about the, the the trails and our support continued support of the trails and 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 the, that's whole hum. What do you want to talk about that? Because <laughs> because I think that that bridge. How about just talk about the bridge? That bridge down there that's going to yeah that it's going to connect the trail all the way. The bridge finally got done and that's a great thing. I think that's really good. Do, yeah. Does she didn't even know where that bridge is? The yeah. cross from Montreal. Walked on that bridge. Great. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make one. sure we didn't weren't talking off subject yeah. here and didn't yeah. know. And, and that goes right along with with our continued support and increased support of Wrightsville Dam, Wrightsville Res uh, Wrightsville Recreation Recreation, 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 yeah. Recreation yeah. area. Yeah, so we, people we, want to hear about yeah. that too. We supported the financially the construction of the bridge. You probably know that. Yeah, yeah we contribute money. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, any news on? Um, Increase in population in town, building permits, anything like that. That's it's been pretty flat. Okay. Right. We have a lot of new population, new people. We got we right. got one person trying to put in four houses on Sampas on. There's a four or three on the Sampas on. What's mm -hmm. that called? Uh, kitchen development. Was, uh, kitchen, kitchen table. It's kitchen Ryan table. Kitchen or whatever. Yeah. How many is it? Three. Three. But people are fighting that. Well, not anymore. Oh, well, they were. It's, well, well, they were fighting, but they, they got very quiet at the final meeting. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah, I went to that meeting. That's uh, that's three houses. Yeah. Yeah. That. I understand the general population increase. Yeah, if, not if, much. Uh, not much. But you know, if we can keep getting too keep much land development land, land in town. Too much what? Land. There's too much um land trust land in town, not enough lots for people to sell. Yeah, it pushes up the price of available land a lot. Ten thousand dollars an acre. Ten thousand? Oh come on. I just got a price on five acres, a hundred thousand. It's a lot more than ten thousand an acre. That's but twenty thousand bucks. Just looking at a couple of recent offices, ten you know ten acres are going for uh, ninety nine thousand dollars. Couple lots, couple 
That's pretty reasonable. But at, at the same time, I mean, Zach didn't mention it. Uh, I think he was referring to the solar development up by RVs. We're talking about the one with the septic field. Right, right, with the one right down here. Uh, I thought, to the home center. Well, okay. He said it was near the growth center, and I thought this was in this home center. But anyway, yeah. the, the point that yeah. I wanted to make was we have this solar field that uh, went in up at the home center taking up, I think, six lots. Yeah. And at the time, we expressed some concern about residential lots in the village be yeah. used for that. But on the other hand, we said, hey, these have been on the market forever and right. nobody's wanted to buy them. And the guy couldn't, couldn't sell them. No. And you have, so, you, you have uh, Malone's development down here. They'll probably end up being, what, eight houses or so? Where? Malone. Patrick, Pat Malone. Isn't he going to be building a bunch of places over there? Where? On the land that you can't build anything on. No, we can't do that. Well, why do you think he built a big gate down there for? Vontaine put the gate in. Because he thought he could do something down there, but he can't because it's in the flood zone. He can't. He thought he could, but it's, it's not all in the flood zone. Uh, it all is down below. But that land up there is not. But you still got to push the septic uphill. They so have to do that every day. I know they do, but it's expensive. <laughs> but maybe it's worth it. I don't know. We'll in, see. In it's good. Budget, I hope he does. Uh, trends on tax increases and budgets, and that's another thing. To do. We're trying to keep the tax rate down. Yeah. Yeah. So it should be good. You could, yeah. Yeah. Well, then we continue this. Well, we're, we are cognizant of the inflationary pressures on people with fixed income. So we are very conscious of that and we're doing our best to keep the tax rate down as much as possible. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Very, very God's own true. What else can we, um, about in the town reports. You're zipping it? This is a time when you need to unzip it. <laughs> All uh, right. Any big, I mean, the biggest thing that we have to talk about, of course, is staffing. That's mm -hmm. been huge. In Center yeah. Road. Yeah. In Center Road, yeah. yeah. So, County Road. Oh, sorry. I have, yeah. brought up, I have brought to the table some speeding yeah. issues. Other people brought up speeding, and I think Gina, at one point, you said, I'm getting all sorts of calls about speeding. Do we want to put okay. something about speeding in our attempts to address it? Have we attempted to address it? Well, we we don't have Pathetic. much in the way of uh, state police resources. So we may be looking at other resources yeah. to help. Well, we've that. talked about right. Yeah. Now we yeah, I could throw that in there. Sure. Um, right. That's a discussion with the sheriff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that nobody, it? nobody can think of anything else. No. We've gone to all these meetings and done this, <laughs> done next to nothing. Judith, um, how about Judith? She's ready to tell us. Come well, on, Judith. Um, the ARPA funds that we've contributed so far to CV Fiber and yes. oh, that we're yeah, looking really to, good. you know, determine what how else to spend those funds. So, you know, Just discuss the amount that we've received in total and how much we have left to spend. <laughs> Okay. And we are looking forward to having um, an in-person town meeting again. And well, that that's open to discussion. Right. Well, you are. At the time that this goes into the report, we'll know. We can take, we can take it out. <laughs> no. No, you meant that sure. you're looking forward to it. No. I, no yeah. That's fine. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Seth, no, it's okay. I don't, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and you know what? It's a nice thing to say and so. and that COVID is still a a life-changing force in our community and you're going to yeah. talk about that yeah yeah okay so let's move on because we're running late and we're getting slap happy and that's not a good thing yeah it's almost like bedtime i know it is and, uh, and it's reflected in what you're saying so um the next item is discussion on arpa funds to do this point so the discussion that we wanted to have about this was how to promote some town discussion on the use of the remaining ARPA funds. Now we have some things that we've got, we've already committed some of the funds to CV fiber. And there's also some things, one-time expenses in our budget that we're over on that we can use the funds on, which is, we can use it on the salary, can we not? So um, have you identified the ARPA funds that we're gonna already committed to using? I have not identified a detailed list yet. No. Right, because we we gave a hundred for CV fiber. What's the total that we have? Just seven, seven eighty. Seven sixty. Okay. 
Okay. Did, did we commit anything besides the CV five? No, no, okay. but we do have some like budget shortfalls. Expenses, okay. you know, okay. the land and the digitization of records, right. the yeah. staffing costs, the you Isn't know, there are just things. about everything eligible. The way that we had the general pretty drawn close. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, a, it's a pretty wide net. And stuff that matching for federal funds is that eligible or not? No, okay. I don't think you can yeah. Can't yeah. use you federal can. funds to match federal funds. That's usually the case. Yeah. yeah. But one of the things that you can do is you can use it for some of your general expenses, mm -hmm. and then then you take the your tax revenue that you took in the for the general expenses and put that aside for a project that you identify. Right. Mm -hmm. so we, could that gravel, we could buy gravel and salt with it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is but, not. A very imaginative way to use this. No, but then you have that revenue. Are offsetting basically expenses. You know, I mean, it it is certainly the only caution there, of course, is you know certain things like if you hire people, unless you're planning to let them go at some point, it's it's a temporary fix. So right. I think yeah, and, and CT has been cautioning about right. it's not watch covering your budget yeah. because at some point you're going to have to pay for that or you're dramatically changing. So well, you can hold the but you can hold future, you know, you can hold your expenses down for a couple of years with ARPA money, but that third yeah, year, yeah. I'll tell you, it's gonna go. That's a bad idea. But yeah, but but really what we need to do is identify how much money we have that could be thrown in a project and just keep it simple for everyone to understand is we have this money available for a project. Even if the ARPA money can't go to the project, you can shift your tax revenues and your, you know what I mean, is you pay for your expenses yeah. with the ARPA money. And then, for the, so you just got to identify those projects. It can be we, a shell game. we have the yes. mechanisms to move that money around. And we've talked about the, the, maybe using some of that money for the town, new town. I, I want to use it for the town garage. That's my bottom line. But I'm, you know, I'm just one person. That's my opinion. So, well, do, yeah. do we want to go out to the public and ask town that folks the, what, for their yeah, ideas that was, or? That was the question. Yeah, I think I think so. I think it's a good idea for us to identify priorities that we see as a select board and throw them into the mix and yeah. then yeah. invite other people to come up with other ideas. Yeah, we can do or that. Endorse our ideas. Whatever. I mean, we can put down town garage, yeah. we can identify some other things. I don't think that we should identify the shortfalls in the budget as I think we need to make that decision ourselves. If yeah. we want to put thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars into some of these shortfalls that we have, these one time shortfalls. And we can balance our budget. We can do that with yeah. fifty thousand bucks, and we can do that ourselves without asking the general public. Should we put ten thousand dollars for somebody? Blah, blah blah blah. That's ridiculous. But if we've got six hundred thousand dollars that's left over, then we could say these are the um, projects that we think, as a select board, that we should put this money towards. What does the general public think? We can do or, that. Or 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 do we want to start the other way? We have this money. What are some ideas the public has? Um, you know, so that that can go in the mix of what we're thinking about versus yeah. this is <clears throat> either way. Okay. Yeah. Either way is fine with me. I mean, yeah. I always worry about putting out too much because you get a lot of requests that we're going to have to go through. But I, mean, I guess that's the way to go. What is that's this... just a danger of that? Yeah. What What is this bit about a consulting firm assisting municipalities and managing ARPA funds? How How would they do that? So they they can assist. I haven't gotten it, an incredible amount of detail because I kind of just keep pushing them off because that, I I don't I haven't heard of a lot of towns going this route okay. at least from what I've seen. Um, a lot of times it's it's sad. A lot of their documents are always talking about wastewater because you know they're trying to find ways to help use ARPA funds and help uh, get grants. And it was in, it was initially it's, identified, you know, which, right you know, which is yeah. a big big thing that a lot of yeah. municipalities throughout yeah. the country are doing. Obviously, that's not necessarily is directly related to to us. Um, I mean, I guess it could be, but mm -hmm. it hasn't seemed like that's been the hot topic. Um, so that's really what they're they're doing. They can help queer mm -hmm. your community um but i like i said i haven't delved into an incredible amount of detail and the only thing when i have had conversations with the dlct experts on arpa is they've said just keep in mind that's arpa money of yours it's just going out for consulting work okay. do you really need yeah that? your select board can already identify the things that you need to be yeah. doing okay are you just basically giving 10 to 20 grand away yeah right. yep. um that is of your good point that's no longer staying in your community and that's one reason i haven't been yeah good idea right pushing that's this smart. a lot because I, I michelle and i have had very brief conversations about it um 
we both agree that between the two of us, we think we can handle this and the reporting of it and whatnot. So yeah, uh, and we'd rather keep the money in the community. So yeah. Yeah. I just thought I'd mention it because it has come to me. So if you were interested in pursuing any additional information on this, we certainly can, but no. That yeah. sounds good. Okay. So I guess the boils down to um identifying how much money we actually have each time we so maybe what we need from you is um what are the budget items that we can that we need to fix with our money? A one shot thing. And then how much money will we have left? And then the only other question is how are we going to reach out to the public? Are we going to mail a questionnaire? Are we going to talk about a town meeting? What are we going to do? Are we going to do a mailing? Put it in with the ballot? Why don't we, sh I mean, John, you mentioned earlier a questionnaire about, about MSAC at a uh, town meeting. Um, why don't we do something at the town forum and town meeting to try to get some ideas? From people? Maybe have that as a basis for kicking off discussions and then a public forum after that. Oh, at the beginning of our forum? Um, not, after town meeting day. Oh, after town meeting? Yeah, have a separate, after we've had a chance no. to look at what people have said and, and written down, then a public forum. So would you have a handout? I mean, Ju Judith was- What's that, Judith? No, I was trying to understand the timing. So yeah. introduce the idea before town meeting, but actually get the responses and the input after town meeting. So are you suggesting generating a survey prior to, or maybe handing out town meeting or even with the ballots and then asking people to um, submit them, you know, at town meeting or within a week or something, and then we'll review them. I'm, I'm just, Sure. Following I mean, up on what you suggested. Yeah, there's, there's lots of different ways to do it. What I was thinking was having a discussion of it at the town forum and a written survey at town meeting. Uh, I hadn't thought about sending it out with the ballot. That's what I think we should do. I, I think town meeting is too narrow an audience. I think uh, if there's no legal problem with us doing that, we're paying for the, the ballots to go out. So I don't think there'd be a legal problem. Then, yeah, that's a really good idea. It's like Bill Doyle used to do those surveys. Yeah. I Something think if similar. you put it in with a ballot that you mail, you're going to have more participation. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I'm not against the town meeting thing whatsoever. Yeah. I just think we can't just target town meeting attendees. Right. We have to target a wider audience. Right. But but yeah. then, yeah, in terms of the timing, I was thinking that this would be a way of kicking off the discussion of generating ideas. Yeah. And then we would have a another discussion in person, online as well, afterward, after town meeting. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does to some extent. The only the only thing is, you know, in some ways it'd be better, in my way of thinking, if we had targeted projects already. Judith is the other side of it, which I understand completely what she's saying. Well, she's saying we could have targeted projects. I, I like for... no, no, she's saying that just put it out there and people will have ideas. Right. Which is not a bad way of doing it, except if it's all over the place. So if which is okay, except that if you could target people's reactions to six or eight projects, it's a or maybe bit. the sur the survey. You know, these are the types of you know whether it be you know infrastructure yeah. or wh yeah. whatever you know types of projects or providing them with parameters for what yeah. would qualify. I, I think like you have to have some parameters and some sort of something some well, structure. How about this for a parameter? Plainfield, when they put out their call to uh, to, to residents to come up with ideas for the ARPA funding, they said, here's where you find our town plan. Our town plan has a bunch of action items in it. Uh, based on those action items, what specific proposals would you make for using the ARPA fund? Well, you can draw from that. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, maybe have a catch-all saying, if we're not imaginative enough to think of something for the for the in the town plan, um, what else would you try to sell? It? But try to keep it within the parameters of all the work that people have already put into thinking about the future of this town already. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, you know because we get it's getting late. I think we've got some ideas. Yeah. I think we've got some ideas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, because I know we've got other things to talk about. It's already nine thirty, and. Um, 
Gina's already has a few things she's got to work on with the ARPA targeting the budget items that are a shortfall. We should start with that first. But we've got some time between now and town meeting, which is probably the time if we mail out a survey with the ballot. You know, we've got a couple of three months. Yeah. To, uh, so. yeah. Okay. Okay. So access permits. We've got a couple of those to look at. Yeah, these are both related to a recent subdivision that was approved by the BRB. Um, and Guthrie was actually, he knew about these in the process of the DRB approval. So mm -hmm. he was aware um, of these curb cuts, but he did review them and approve them. And you have a map. So this yeah. is yeah. The on Cummings Road. Road. Cummings Road. Cummings Road. It says north of intersection of Cummings Road and County Road, which would be on County Road. Mine is Cummings Road. No, well, it's Cummings Road. Road. Ron Cummings. Okay. Cummings. Cummings. Okay. So it's unclear in the text. It's good. Right Let here. Me find the map. And he's he's looking yeah, at his your map. This line yeah. of sight and everything. So. Yeah. One of them does require a culvert. Um, the mm -hmm. other does not. And does the town provide the culvert? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Lot two subdivision. Lot three. And this is north. Yeah. I, this historically probably the. Uh, who knows. I don't know. Who puts culverts in the initial culvert? The town or the property owner? The property owner usually does it. Okay. I think Guthrie might give you a different answer. <laughs> I, I, it's in the town. Is, is I think the property owner usually does. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, town right away. Came by I mean, town we. That. I mean, we. No, not Miss Driveway. If it's in the right of way, way, officially, it's not main. It's not maintained by the town, but in. Practice, my understanding, talking with the road foreman, it is. It, it is. And that might be Mike Garen that I've talked to about. You're better off to have a work yeah. than the not one, yeah. one working one. Yeah. Well, if it's in it actually would be. So it would be in the town right away. It's in the ditch. So <laughs> the town would maintain it. But many times the landlord does. Yeah. In practice, his driveway, over weeds. We got it. You got it. Some people work in the town right away without permit. Come in. <laughs> okay. So, anybody have any objections to this? These curb cuts? That's what they are. Yeah, I think we need to um, make a motion. I think we. It says sign the application, but don't we usually make a motion on these? Yeah, it's yeah. right here. I think Ed. you have done a motion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You do. I make a motion that um, should we. This is a good. This is a, really a good motion for you. <laughs> but you, so I, I move so it, it's usually separate motions, isn't it? Yeah, we have to left. reference uh, yeah. the access. Yeah, I'm going to say permit number 22 dash There you go. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. After good. reviewing that and the curb cut, which was approved by the by the. Uh, I'm just, I move to approve the curb cut uh, authorized in uh, permit 22075. I'll second it. Okay. No, no. Oh, oh so he's making it. Uh, well, your name's not going to be. So, I'm just by you second it, John. <laughs> no, so you can make the motion if you want. No, I'm I just suggesting wording. Okay, too controversial. <laughs> oh, it is? No. <laughs> so just you did 075. Yeah. Oh, so how about 076? Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> That's a separate one. All those. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes appear. And o okay. 076. Same motion for 076. In the same second. <laughs> John got his name in there. And you have the actual curb cuts there in those file folders. Yeah. I have it. Yeah, we, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. One. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So, we, so we all have to find that before we. What? You yeah. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's 076. <laughs> <laughs> and it's you've been unanimously approved. What do you need? I'm on open now. No, I'm not. There's two. Okay. All right. Um, access permit is done. Discussion on town. Oh, discussion on town management in light of COVID 19. I wonder when we're going to get to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think Carl has some things to say. Yeah, we're actually pretty much right on time, but it's also pretty late. So I'm going to admit about a third, uh, two thirds of what I was going to say and maybe bring it up next time. Uh, but I will say that. Um, I thought you going to be out of town for that one. Uh, by the community, the transmission standard, and I'll, I will email this to you, Deidre, uh, of the CDC. 13 of Vermont's 14 counties are at high or substantial rates of transmission. 
And this is what the case results estimated, as I always say, to be greatly underreported compared to the time before. Mm -hmm. At home testing kits were widely available. Washington County is at substantial transmission. And only 28% of Vermonters age five or over have received the updated bivalent COVID 19 booster vaccine. And that uh, vaccines uh, have saved millions of lives, according to a recent study. Well, um, so masking, getting the full round of vaccinations, and being cautious around holiday gatherings can help reduce the spread of COVID and reduce the death rate. I'm just frustrated that COVID is on track to remain the third leading cause of death in the United States uh, for, for the third year in a row after cancer and heart disease. And you know, we could be doing more to slow it spread. There. More vaccine. More vaccines, for example. More, mm -hmm. more, max, more masking in more public places. Uh, right tonight, the Christmas Carol. Uh, Willem Lang was supposed to um, read that at Lost Nation Theater on Friday, but it got delayed tonight. Lost Nation Theater is saying everybody who comes in must have a mask. Hmm. Hmm. Still here. Hmm. Um, are you good? Uh, I'm good. Thank Did you. you have anything to say on? Okay. See you, Mike. Have a nice night. Thanks for coming in. Have a nice rest of the night. Thank you. Um, and yeah. a good day tomorrow, too. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to put that in there. So. <laughs> uh, we have warrants to sign. I checked them out. They look uh, pretty, like, pretty boring warrants. Not too much? Yes. There's not that much going on. Yeah. So we occasionally we there's people who are who don't have the funding or have a family present that can help and we need to pay for the burial of a person right now and then. Is that on you? Oh City of Montpelier, we're paying burial. No, we pay them to do the digging. Oh, to do the digging. Yes. Oh. Yeah, we, we used to have the state, uh -huh. I think, pays for people who, who are in. No, we don't. No, that's just the ordinary cost of digging up a site. Because what we used to do is have Elliot do it. And Elliot was getting paid under the table. This is a big problem. And there was no insurance. And one day he swung the thing around and knocked someone over. And that was a big concern because they're working for cash. No insurance. No blah, blah. No nothing. But this was in the city of Montpelier? Now... We hire Montpelier to come up with their equipment to dig the hole. Oh, they're, ce they're cemetery people. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I know. It's not like the water department or something. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. Yeah. We don't have Elliot doing the back going. Oh, no. So it was a problem. Oh, okay. boy. 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 What's today? The 19th? The 19th. 19th already. Do you want to sign this before I pass it to Carl? I would like to. Okay. I'm just going with whatever you want. Here you go. Okay. Uh, Warrants. Did you want to... Um, I'm going to leave you a space right underneath. Did you want to talk to us while we're signing these? Because you can. Just because yeah. it's getting so late. I got an email today from Four Corner Schoolhouse um, for their voted article. They're requesting $4,500 for the fiscal 24 appropriation compared to $4,400 in the prior year. Um, so bringing that to the board. So $100 more? Yeah. Okay. okay with me. Yeah. Okay with me. Okay with you, Judith? Yep. And then um, wanted to let you know that Guthrie and I submitted a um, application for a Better Roads grant uh, related to a project on Haggett Road. Uh, we did work with Jaron Borg, who is the uh, river management engineer with ANR, to evaluate the site and determine what would be needed. So we did submit a request for that. It, it's approximately twenty-four thousand dollars. Where is it? Requesting Haggett. Oh, Haggett. Okay. Yep. Uh, and this is my note about the fire department fund balance. That the last meeting was noted at six thousand one hundred fifty-four dollars. Right. But there was an additional uh, interest posted, so it's an additional thirteen dollars and thirty cents. Um, and that is emotion. In the so you know. Gonna do. So you want a motion? If you, I mean, it's a pretty immaterial amount, but because to Carl's point, because we have a dollar amount on that motion, I. 
Yeah. I thought we needed, I needed to mention this. Yeah. yeah. For audit sure. purposes, I wanted to ensure that the payment that we are sending to them is yeah. consistent. Exactly. I, I will include a copy of your minutes. Yeah. To mm -hmm. two things like this. So do you yeah. want us to clear it up with a motion to did, did you want to make two separate checks? Or well, you already made the check. check. Yeah, I've already made the check. Mm -hmm. With the interest group. So yeah. For the $6,767.30. So I'm, I move, how's this? I move to clarify that uh, our motion to, um, what was it, the East Montpelier fund balance? Yeah, ESF, the, from the, fund balance. It, the ESF, yeah, to um, transfer the remaining amount of the East Montpelier facility fund balance to the East Montpelier Fire Department includes uh, all funds in the balance Okay. period. And no no dollar amount in That's today's perfect. motion. How's that sound? That's perfect. Okay. We need a second? Yeah. Judith second. I might second. give it to Judith yeah. because, you know, once in a while someone else's name needs to be in the minutes. You know what? I was looking right at Judith waiting for her to raise her hand. That's why I said it loud like that. That's really good of you. You're a prompt too. Good. So John doesn't have to be in on on the on the motion. You're not, you didn't make the motion, you didn't second it. Right. And he's not going to vote against it. He's so very he's altruistic. Wait a minute. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes have it. The ayes appear to have it, they do have it. You can get your name in there if you say no. Okay. And that's pretty much it. There have been no permits issued since your last meeting. And then I have the future dates now with January 3rd, January 17th, February 6th, February 20th. Okay. Awesome. February is going back to the regular schedule. January, obviously, is the altered Tuesday schedule. Uh, great. I'm agreeing with you. I'm happy. I want to thank you for uh, putting in realistic times for the discussion. And um, yeah, we're finishing up pretty close to the time specified in here. So you, you let us know that it was going to be a long meeting rather than trying to cram everything into a template to finish earlier. Yes, I, I expected a smart text from Seth. Yeah. We got the agenda. Hell no. One. No, no, no joke. It's a serious, this is serious stuff and we can't be. Kind of is what I, it is. I have a couple of things People under other talk. business if we're on to that. Other business, we already said there wasn't any other business. I didn't say that. You well, didn't I didn't hear. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. This is a I said additions to the agenda. Right. And you're saying, you, know, other you said there wasn't any. 945. 945. I can wait around until 945 if you want. No, no. If, okay. you, if you have a serious need to talk, then okay. we'll let it happen. So um, I, I just want to know, are all the select board members on your new email addresses now? So oh, geez, I did. I, He's been having some time. I'm, yeah, okay. I got the information today, though. I just got to act on it. Okay. Amy, yeah. you waited too long, didn't Amy you? Yeah, I waited too long. Amy, Amy, yeah, I haven't used it. Has anybody sent me anything? Because I'm up and live, but I check it every day, and nobody sent me anything. So, except that. for Gina. Gina sent you, me something. Okay, but I, now I know to send you stuff at that. Okay, thank you. And the other thing is, um, I'm sorry, what's your name from Orca? Hello? I can't hear you. Hello? <laughs> Hi. So sorry. Yeah, no problem. What, what's your name? I'm sorry. Rowan. Okay, I'm sorry. Got, we got uh, while you're here, I was really taken by your putting the camera back there and freeing up all this room. But on the other hand, I noticed that that meant that it's pretty hard for you to film the people who are sitting in those seats. And that got me thinking about this whole arrangement and having people back to the camera versus front to the camera that Judith was uh, arra uh, raising. So I'm wondering, would it make more sense to, I mean, we'd have to move the screen or have it off center or something, but just move our tables over this way and have the visitors sit up against that wall and that the biggest way, challenge we have is centering this on the screen right so i've looked at how to try to rearrange that is the biggest if this was mounted right that would solve that problem that'd be a hundred dollars or so based on my experience um or if uh, the screen moves over yeah there could be that too yeah yeah what do you guys think of that Uh, does anyone I'm, have I'm ambivalent. I'm ambivalent. I'm ambivalent. I'm, I'm frankly too tired to think about it. 
Me too. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, I've gone past the stage of thinking. Now I'm just reacting. Yeah. Fair enough. I hear you. <laughs> I'm the same way. Thinking in this space. Yeah. It would be finding someone who can help do all these things that you're describing. Mounting, I'm not climbing up there to mount to mount that. So, and trying to find people these days is easy. Mm -hmm. So, um, I I could mount. I've done that at my house. I could mount that. What if we? What if? What if? I don't know. Just set up over in that corner or over in that corner and just shot this way. I think there are a lot of other places the camera could be. I, yeah. yeah. I I think there's. A lot of angles where nobody's back and doing. Uh -huh. Okay, well, let's just keep this discussion going. Yeah. I'm okay with my back. But... Well, and at right. some point, it's... that will move back out of the, yeah, right. the base scanner. Well, it's going to get the phone. But back. it needs to go back into my office. Right. But until until I can go through the horde of information that is in my it's office right. in you preparation for the new furniture, it needs to stay. Yeah. Right. Right. But it's a, it's a question. It actually can't work right now because it's on a slant floor. I didn't want it put on the floor at all in the okay. first place because I knew that was going to mess it up. Oh, boy. He's got sign so it's a question of courtesy to our visitors and courtesy to our people who are watching online to oh, yeah. have their faces uh, easily visible. I don't have a problem. I just think that you could do it by sit being there or there. Maybe. Maybe. No. The other okay. thing that would help, and I had a conversation with the other Orca gentleman that was here earlier. Um, I asked if they had any towns that were actively using an owl, uh -huh. um, and he said they actually have one. And he said that I could actually, I have not pursued ordering that because I just needed to figure out where it's even going to go. I mean, this isn't exactly a conference room table, so it's a, it's a little difficult. And he said that they have one, and he said that they could come and bring it and mock like um, our yeah, room. I don't know if folk, other folks have participated in meetings with OWL, but it's the perspective is kind of funky. Um, and for those who are watching remotely, it's I, I prefer the gallery that we see on Zoom versus the OWL um, because everybody is smushed. That's been my experience, um, whereas here, I can see everybody in the conference room. Yep, I might see their back, but with OWL, they kind of choose vantage points and they kind of change the, like they kind of smush people together and it's hard to really see each individual person. That's I just my- I have never used one. I've just heard of them mm -hmm. and I've heard good things about them. Mm -hmm. um, I like the idea of having Orca come in and test that out. This setup we have here is not yeah. very- for a lot yeah. of people. Yeah, I mean, we can try it. This camera that you're seeing us through is a webcam that's supposed to be mounted to a computer. It's yeah. not a camera. But it's doing yeah. pretty good. It it's does pretty well, right there. what it is, but we've got cords everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. We've got Bluetooth speakers that some people have had difficulty connecting to yeah. in here. So that's what I was trying yeah. to get something that could be a one-stop shop. Yeah. So well, maybe we can try it and see what people think. Yeah, another option is uh, there are cameras. We use those at the Unitarian Church in Montpelier. I think maybe Montpelier City Hall has something similar uh, that mounts on the wall, and they are very good at moving oh, yeah. in and rotating in all directions. Oh, yeah, a true video conference camera, absolutely. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what I've experienced. Mm -hmm. That that's a lot more. That's a lot more money. Um, <laughs> it is. Yeah. 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 They are. Okay. Hey, what's next? What do you think's next? I think it's adjourning <laughs> next, and I move that we adjourn this meeting tonight. A second. Don, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Don, you got your name in right here.